Test, test, one, two, test, test.
Where's the sound coming out of? We're testing one, two, three. Yes. She. Okay. I understand it's a pretty good sized room at Fullerton, which is great as far as a uh, number of people attending. For those of us in the Zoom room, There were approximately 60 CSU folks in San Jose. Okay, great. They're working on the stream to sound, uh, the stream of the sound to the audience in the room. We would hear each other so we were on the laptop. Probably just play some music so I don't have to keep chatting. Testing. Well, can, Testing. Are any one, of our mics three. Even working? Yeah. Yeah. They're working fine. But we share tasks. <laughs> they can hear us. Can do the different types of Fullerton hearing us yet? Can you tell her no? One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. So the sound's not even going through the mic right now. Looks like we're getting closer to getting started. Let's see. That's right. She's not talking. Hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Mercury is retrograde. We've been trying to figure out all of these technical issues today. Um, it looks like we can see something. We Testing. can see Kathy now. Um, Kathy, can you do an audio test so we can see if we can hear you with playback in the room? Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? You hear me in the room. Testing you guys one, hear her two, well three. enough to move forward? Okay, we're being a little renegade, but let's just all get through this together. <laughs> so, Kathy, are you able to hear my audio? Play this song just so they have a constant stream of music. Please let me know when you can hear my music. Okay. I, I am not hearing um, anything in the room, yeah, so I know I'm pod, probably chatting over um, who's ever in the room at Fullerton. Okay, you're ready for me to start, but I can't hear anything going on in the room. Uh, your microphone is cutting up really bad. I can hear you fine. 
Thank you. Dean. Same minute, San Marcos. Thank you. Working on AV in the room at Fullerton so that they can channel. Obviously, they've got um, us going out, but now we need to see if we can hear them coming in. Well, I'm not sure exactly how to start without being able to hear from others in the room. <laughs> yes, Kathy, can you hear me? Courtney, give me your cue if you just want Kathy, can you hear me now? Ah, yes, sir. All right. Somebody press the mute button. <laughs> so it's very simple. Details. Those little details. <laughs> so it's good. Everybody can hear me on the Zoom? Yes. All right. We were hearing you anyway. This works, 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 works. There's an echo. Oh, what now? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Is it good? No, this. Back to the echo. Let's use this. Good morning. Good morning, can, you, can ha, Kathy, can you hear me? Awesome, all right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Adobe event at Cal State Fullerton. My name is Amir Dabirian. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology and the CIO for, the, for our campus, Cal State Fullerton. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and it's a pleasure everyone in the, in the, in the Zoom. Um, we get, I guess we have 28 people. If I'm right, 29 now, so it's adding on. So it's great uh, having everyone here on, on the campus and also remotely via our uh, teleconferencing. Um, I'm very excited about today, and I'll tell you why. You know, in 2010, which is nine years ago, we were starting our journey with Adobe. When it was, the product was very expensive for every student to own and it was everybody wanted to have it. So we started a journey with Adobe. How do we bring it to our students everywhere? Not just Cal State Fullerton, but across the system. It took nine years. Now we have every, we finally have a system-wide Adobe that makes the product available for all our students, faculty, and staff. We have over 185,000 licenses across the, the system for our half a million of our students across the system. So it's, it's bring a joy to, my, uh, to me personally to see that we are putting digital literacy in our students' hands and our faculty staff hands across the system. And we balancing the concept of haves and have nots across the system. It's the same product availability across every single institution. And it was made possible by each of your campuses and Adobe working together to make this particular deal come true. And again, I am extremely thrilled and extremely happy to be one of the champions. There's many, many champions in our campuses that made this possible, that brought the, probably the, one of the few agreements that was done system-wide and it was done across the campuses, and each of the campuses agreed to be part of it. So it was a very complicated project. It took us about five months to do the project, but I'll let you know. Uh, I would say we, we talked to about 150 to 200 different people across the system, trying to bring the, the deal together. 
uh, but now it is available. And the next step of this, how do we put this in hand of our students? How do we put it part of our curriculum? How do we make a digital literacy possible for every single student in California State University system and Cal State Fullerton as our campus? We have been working are embedding this in our curriculum in the past two, two and a half years. Uh, we have over 2,000 students that really part of a curriculum using Adobe products in, in CSUF. Uh, we have partner with different departments, such as English, College of Business, Communications, uh, uh, you know, Visual Arts, Performing Arts, and all other departments around campuses to make this part of their curriculum and make digital literacy possible for our students. So I want to thank Adobe. I want to thank the CSU. And I want to uh, thank all of our faculty that are here that make, the, make this project moving forward. Uh, it's a thrill to have uh, Todd Taylor here. I just want to give a shout out to Todd. Uh, he is uh, one of the key individuals that I have uh, aspire to be as a faculty member because he is, he is really making, uh, changing lives every day and really have an impact of this product moving forward. He's the one that helped us, our English department, Bonnie's here, uh, to move forward with our uh, digital literacy, our, our, our English department and our English 101 courses. So we are very thrilled to that. I'm gonna give a shout out to Kathy Fernandez from the CSU that here we'll talk in a second that really supporting this project from the, from the Chancellor's Office. And let you know that we here at Cal State Fullerton, we are here to support the entire CSU when you have questions and answers to move this project forward. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, and thank you all of you for your patience this morning. Um, glad to see we're up and running now. So without further ado, because speaking of patience, she has been hanging on for the last 20 minutes, um, ready to speak. So it is a great um, honor this morning to pass it off to Kathy Fernandez. She's the Senior Director of Learning Design and Technologies from the Chancellor's Office. And her and I have been working very closely together um, on putting this event together for you today. So Kathy, it's all yours. Great, thank you. And again, thanks to everybody for their patience. Uh, technology, when it gets out of the way, is very powerful. I'm sorry I can't be there with all of you today. I would love to be in the room, um, but just based on uh, extensive travel, I needed to be uh, here back in Chico today. Um, so I do want to thank uh, Amir and his leadership in uh, also being patient, uh, nine years in the making. and. Uh, we all understood the value of what it would be for uh, our CSU students to have access to the Adobe tools and now to gain uh, the skills they need. We know that uh, as they go out into their work environment that um, you know, it's pretty uh, quite likely that they're going to run into the Adobe products and being able to leverage those products you know, adds to their skill set. And for the digital literacy of the 21st century learner, this is an important partnership I also wanted to make sure that I thank CSU Fullerton for being willing to host this event. Um, I don't know if Courtney has been able to let you know, but last week uh, there was a NorCal uh, event at the Adobe headquarters, and I think we had something like 60 CSU people there. And uh, having uh, quite a few more of you here in the room, in the Zoom room and at Fullerton, it is a great kickoff uh, with Adobe to partner and to make sure now that we get to leverage the investment that we've made across the CSU, uh, faculty, staff, students in leveraging this partnership and making sure that it works for all of us. Um, I know that, um, uh, of course, uh, many years ago, some of the things we used to talk about when integrating technology is we used to uh, tack uh, technology onto the side of our course. In other words, we just continue to teach our course and by the way, we add this and we add that. But today we really want to talk about also sharing amongst the CSU uh, some of the best practices for integrating the Adobe products with the students in both teaching and learning. In other words, what works for faculty, what doesn't work for faculty, what works for students, what doesn't work for students, so that we can really leverage one another within the CSU. Since we are the largest system uh, you know, around the world, it's important for us to leverage the resources and expertise within, and that means each of you. So being able to bring this community together, and I hope to continue to synergize the relationship that we have 
between CSU and Adobe, as well as uh, around the campuses, so that faculty can share with with, uh, with one another how they have implemented and how they have integrated into their curriculum. And so um, with that, uh, again, I'm really excited for today. I look forward. I know that Adobe is always on the uh, on the edge of uh, spurring innovation. And now we're talking about spurring that innovation in the classroom. And I, I just think that's a great thing. Again, thanks to all of you. I look forward to further engaging with each of you as we continue to develop this relationship. I know that Courtney will be asking, you know, at the end of all of this for feedback, please do let us know we're listening to you about what works, what doesn't work, and how we can continue to work together across the CSU. Thanks again, and uh, I'll be online for a little while uh, listening in. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you, Kathy. So here we are. Um, we're so excited that you are here with us today, and let's make sure this is working. And I'm just gonna speed through this for the sake of time. I'm Courtney, I think I've met some of you, but there are some unfamiliar faces here. Um, I recently joined the Adobe education team, and I've been working, as Kathy mentioned, very close with her on kind of thinking through the academic side and putting these events together. And I'm here today also with my colleague, Liz Arias, that's in the back. And her and I are both working with the CSU system from the Adobe education team. So we want to welcome you here today. And as Kathy said, we really want to hear your feedback and your insights and your thoughts. And that's really what um, the point of today is. So as Kathy mentioned, you know, we kind of have this alphabet soup with Adobe sometimes, all these different apps and letters and what do they mean? Why do they keep changing every day when they update um, mobile apps? And really the point of today is about the pedagogy and the teaching and learning side and the learning outcomes. The tools come second. Um, and that's why we really want to hear from you guys today and help you collaborate um, with each other and really kind of start to talk about how you can think about integrating this into your curriculum in a meaningful way. So again, the focus here is on digital literacy. And just a hot second about myself. Um, I grew up in California. A lot of my family went to Fresno State. Are there any bulldogs in the house? No bulldogs. My parents still live a mile from the campus. And I, I've used these tools for a very long time. I used to work um, in TV and film media production. And I came from academia. So really, I'm used to being you guys and sitting in your seat. Um, I was recently at the University of Southern California, uh, where I developed um, our school-wide digital literacy initiative there, and was also teaching and designing courses. And so I made a lot of mistakes along the way, and I really appreciated being able to collaborate with colleagues from other institutions. And Todd and Amir um, are folks that I've been working with for seven years now. So I'm standing here today wearing the Adobe hat. Um, but really, I've, I've been on a very similar journey to you guys. And my role here at Adobe is really to be your Sherpa and to help you on this path and to help kind of define the vision and help with strategy. Um, so again, thank you guys for being here today. I'm just going to skip through some of these because we're already starting a little bit late. But the point here is that Adobe is very um, committed to education. And it's one of the things that really caught my eye as an educator early on when I had partnered with Adobe at USC. And so just a little bit of um, some just laundry items for today. Again, we would love to hear your feedback. We just set up a really, hopefully, not very painful um, form to get some feedback. So that's the short link on here. I'll send it out again afterwards. But if you want to take note of it, um, Kathy and I just really want to kind of hear your thoughts and see what we can do to make these better moving forward. And then there's two hashtags if you guys want to share on, on social. Uh, one of them, I think, is getting a little bit cut off, at least in the room, which is Adobe EDU. That's just what we use for Adobe Education. And then I started using Adobe CSU. I just want to see if we can give it some traction, because you know CSU only stands for California State University. Um, so we're going to try it out and see if we can use it on the different campuses and just kind of get a nice snapshot um, over time of what's happening within the CSU system. So with that, um, it is an honor to bring up our first speaker to kind of start taking us down this roadmap of the CSU journey. 
So I'd like to invite to the stage Megan Martinez. Um, she's a senior career advisor with Cal State Fullerton. And for those of you online, let me just read a little bit about her background. She completed her undergraduate work at CSUF studying child development and sociology. During this time, she became involved with many student affairs programs, sparking her passion for working with college students. As a result, she pursued a master's degree in higher ed with an emphasis in student affairs at Penn State. After completing her degree, she came back to Fullerton to help business students with their own career journeys, and we are lucky to have her today with us. Thank you, Megan. All right, so I might need help getting set up. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Talk amongst yourselves. Why did you log into my? I didn't. <laughs> when I do my email, it just goes. Oh, it goes straight you. to mine? Uh -huh. Why? I don't know. You can never remember. Totally. Yeah, here. Do you want to? Did you want to? Um, I don't know if I have any jokes just yet. <laughs> Maybe once I can finally get some coffee. Does anyone have any questions while we're? Waiting again. Yes, thank you, sir. I have a comment. It's so nice to see so many women in technology. <laughs> Did you? And we're celebrating International Women's Day. <laughs> Woo! I know. Isn't it lovely? I. It's such a diverse lineup. Thank you for that comment. I have. So the question for those of you online, I don't even know if you can hear me, um, is about the Adobe Education Exchange. Let me just see a show of hands. How many of you guys have been on that site before? It's awesome. And there's actually, um, we just did a redesign of it. I don't work on the team that does that, although I have a lot of content on there from when I used to teach. Um, and Todd, who you're going to hear from later for our keynote, is like one of the kings of the education exchange. He has all sorts of stuff on there, including an entire textbook that he created that he'll be talking about later. Um, but since we, yeah, so the great thing about the Adobe Education Exchange, and again, I, um, if we have time at the end, I will show some of this to you, but I'm certainly going to follow up um, with some resources for all of you. The great thing about the education exchange is it's like this giant, um, sharing space online, and it's for educators by educators. And I say that because we have oodles of tutorials out there through LinkedIn Learning, through the Creative Cloud that, again, are about the tools. 
the reason why I have always liked the education exchange, and I'm sharing it with all of you, is that it's really thinking about it through a teaching lens. Because again, it's educators creating content and putting it on there. So it's not just, here's how you use the tool, or even like, here's a project in a box. It's also, here are the rubrics, here are the student learning outcomes, here, is a, here are examples of a range of student projects um, and maybe how I graded them. So it's just, it's really looking at it through a unique lens for educators. So if nothing else, like, I encourage you to t just peek through that site and bookmark it. Um, it's a really great resource moving forward. And it, there's content being added to it every day. There's so much stuff in there. So thank you for that. It's edX dot adobe dot com I believe Liz just put it in the chat pod thank you Liz are we ready to go Woo -hoo. okay technology right um, so thank you for the warm welcome and introduction so again my name is Megan Martinez I'm the senior career advisor over in Mahalo Career Services so um, mostly what I do for Cal State Fullerton is work with business students in their career exploration and journey. Um, so when I had the opportunity to teach a professional and career development course, I hopped right on that um, and helped develop some of the, some of the content they use today uh, in the course. So I'm going to share with you um, how our journey progressed um, and why we use Adobe in our class. So a little bit about me. Um, I went to here. Uh, for my degree, I got my degree in child development and sociology. Woo uh, my mom was a teacher, um, thought I wanted to be a first grade teacher just like she did until I took an internship and realized I don't have the patience for them. Um, but I do have the patience for college students. That was a much better fit for me. Uh, so then I went away, far away, to Penn State for my master's degree because I had to get out of California. Um, I'd been here my whole life, just a little bit. Um, so I was there for two years, loved the experience, loved the university, absolutely amazing, but had to come back. Um, so then found a position at Cal State Fullerton, and that has been my home for the past almost four years in June. Um, working in the Career Services Department under the College of Business. So I've really enjoyed my time there um, and have been able to make great strides. I now use Adobe also uh, in my job there. Um, but I'm here just to talk to you about my role as a part-time lecturer for the BUE D300 class. So let me explain kind of what this class is. So it is a professional and career development course. So what that means is there um, is content in there that's career related, also just life skills, um, executive leadership skills. Um, so this class kind of covers the gamut. It was uh, mainly introduced for transfer students to help them get accustomed to the university um, and help set them up for success. Um, but since then, a lot of seniors um, and even sophomores and freshmen have found it very beneficial to be in a class like this. It goes over a lot about the university as a whole and teaches them how to be successful here. Um, in the college courses. Um, so that's where I am today. So I'm going to cover a couple of things. So I have some statistics uh, based on Adobe product usage, uh, not only within uh, Cal State Fullerton, but also within the BUED 300 class. Um, also, um, how I approach teaching and using it in my class. Um, and choosing the right Adobe products. There are so uh, many uh, that was alluded to earlier. How do you choose the right one to work with your students and why we chose the ones that we did? Um, actually integrating it into the classroom, so making it more of a conversation and kind of an everyday reminder as opposed to here's one class on just this one assignment. Uh, knowing when to change. Uh, technology is always evolving, um, and so are our students. So being able to make your syllabus and your assignments flexible to what they need and what they're going to respond to. Um, and then I have some examples of our students' work. So first is some statistics. So since spring 2017, when this uh, project was rolled out on campus, um, we've had 39 faculty participating uh, with 92 class section impacting uh, 2,379 students. So very exciting uh, across the campus. Uh, and then for our class in particular, for the BUD 300, so we also started in spring. Uh, so we were one of the first classes that had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with um, Adobe and our IT department. Very excited for that opportunity. Um, and since then, we've had 13 faculty sign on that teach this course uh, to implement different uh, aspects, uh, 29 class sections from that, and a total of 895 students just from the 300 class. 
So how I approach teaching. Um, again, I'm from a career background. So everything that I look at and everything I see is with that lens. So how can I make my course and what I'm teaching relevant to them after they graduate? So what kind of skills are they going to need throughout this one semester that's going to help set them up for success when they're interviewing or when they're talking to an employer? Um, what can I do? So technology is definitely something that everyone needs uh, a little bit of. Uh, I found that it would have been helpful if I had a stronger background in Adobe. Um, also, um, working a lot with marketing students, a lot of them need the Adobe background uh, to be successful in their future roles. Um, and I have a mix of things like students like with accounting backgrounds or want to go into finance. And they're like, how is this relevant to me? Um, and I said, well, let me tell you. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the interview question, tell me about a time you had to learn something new? or had to learn something different, or something that was challenging for you. Well, this is your story. This is going to be the interview story that you're going to tell to that uh, employer. So when you sit there, you can say, my professor made me learn this Adobe technology. It was very complicated, but I was able to apply uh, what I learned, learn it, do well in the assignment. Um, so that's how they found this relevant to their lives. Um, and it's a confidence builder. So learning something totally outside of your wheelhouse or something relevant for your industry, it gives them the confidence that they need to go forth into the workplace and know that they can learn something that might be intimidating at first. Um, and that there were always also resources to help them. So when, even if they're ready to go into their first level job and they have questions, there's always someone that they can ask for help. Uh, choosing the right products. So I'm very fortunate, and we were very fortunate um, as faculty to have an amazing uh, IT department here um, with super helpful, warm, um, engaging uh, staff that we, had to, we got the opportunity to work with. So when we were approached with the idea, um, me and a few other of the faculty got together and thought, well, you know, what, what would make sense? How can we integrate technology into our classroom? So it started with a group of just four of us. Uh, getting together and thinking about what works. Then we had many meetings with um, uh, Matt and Sapita, really, um, to go over, okay, so all these Adobe products that you have, we're thinking these assignments could work, but we don't know much about the products themselves and what our students can really learn in the just a semester. So they did many tutorials, answered lots of, lots of questions uh, to be able to help us understand and pick the products that we're using today. So then that we, now that we picked the assignments, we've picked the technology that we're using, now we had to actually figure out how to teach the students. Uh, so we thought hands-on is going to be the best. So there are tutorials out there online that a student can walk through and you can give them that assignment, but we wanted them in a computer lab being able to play with the softwares. Um, so we've been very fortunate in having uh, members from our IT department be able to come in and teach the students um, the different products. So they have the computer labs, we get everything set up. Um, they make it as easy as possible for our students to be able to learn these different technologies. Yep. So, we had to change a couple of things. So we've been in this for um, about two years um, with lots of about six semesters. So through that, we've seen things that work and things that don't work. We've had assignments change and have to adjust assignments to be able to figure out what's really connecting with our students. Um, we're big proponents of reading that survey feedback and figuring out how we can adjust and change so that all students are going to get something out of this. So first, we started with Adobe InDesign and Adobe Spark. So those were the two that we um, rolled out with first. So with our InDesign, we had students create a creative resume. Um, we thought that would be helpful for them, um, especially for our marketing students. Um, and then the campus resources presentation is something that we have in the 300 class, and that really goes over a lot of the resources around campus. It's to help them get familiar with, if they have a question, where do they go? So we use Adobe Spark um, for this, and we still do. Um, but we've changed the way that we utilize it because someone, one of the features that um, we found the first semester is uh, with Spark, you can't collaborate as easily as you can with other platforms. So we've since changed now how we actually utilize it. So even in round three, we're still using the campus resources presentation, but now we do it all in class. 
So they're all working together on one laptop as opposed to having them try to go out and figure out how to collaborate um, with that. Um, so after that, you know, we thought that was great. Um, they got the InDesign, but then we realized, are students all gonna need a creative resume? And the answer was no to that. So we thought, okay, this is good for our first round, but let's think of something that they're going to be able to use afterwards. So we went back to the, our IT team and said, okay, InDesign was good and the resumes look really nice, but we're gonna have to change it. We want something a little bit different. So what we did is we have a five-year roadmap that we have students do at the end of the semester. Um, the whole semester, they're really preparing for what does after graduation look like. Um, so we had them do that roadmap. So we thought, let's have them do build that in an Adobe software. And then we had to go back to the drawing board and which one do we use? Um, so we decided on Illustrator. So that is now what we still use um, in our class. We use the Adobe Illustrator for their five-year plan. Um, so we had about a year of that, went really well. Our students were able to understand it um, and put it together. And then we thought, well, you know what? We like using these technologies a lot. Um, is there another assignment that we can add uh, to what our students are doing? Um, and that's when uh, I created the online profile assignment. So this is using Adobe Spark, something I'm very uh, proud of. Um, it is like a LinkedIn profile but built in Adobe Spark. So you're gonna have a lot more freedom to upload your images and projects. Um, I have had students do elevator pitches as well. So I have them design this. And we've actually had a lot of success with this product in particular, um, or this uh, project. Um, we've had multiple students get offers for internships and for jobs just being able to showcase this. It's so different and it's very cutting edge right now. Not many students are using the Adobe Spark platform. So when employ an employer is able to see that, they really do stand out. So that's been amazing uh, to hear from our students. So here's an example. This was our um, creative resume that they built in InDesign. So um, very nice. This was one of our marketing students as well. So she was able to then use this uh, as she was applying, but wasn't as relevant to some of our other students. Um, that's why we changed it. Um, I have two samples um, of an online professional profile as well as a campus resources presentation. Um, it's built in Adobe Spark. Um, there are videos in there. They also used, um, so the, it was built in pa pages. Um, and they used uh, the Adobe Video platform, Adobe Spark Video and Adobe Spark Post to be able to edit their photos. They had to use all three of them when they were creating these. Um, and then this is a sample of their career roadmap. Um, so in here is just where they think they're gonna go in the next five years. Uh, so they were able to pick icons, uh, customize color, and then they had to align it, the bottom text, with um, what their actual roadmap was in their final paper. So they couldn't just use the same as everybody else. Uh, they had to be able to customize it. And I'll take you through, hopefully this works. Are they still gonna be able to see it? Okay, great. So here is um, one of the online profiles. So name and email is in here. Um, this is her elevator pitch. So if I were to play it, it has her background, um, it has some work that she's done. Um, just really great, and it talks about her looking for that full-time role. Um, as you scroll down, it talks about where she's been. So some of the countries that she's lived in um, and her education. So it's very, very similar to a LinkedIn, but a lot more customizable. Um, and then here she talks about her work. So she has her courses that she's done and detailed out what she's been able to learn from those experiences as well as some of her own uh, creations. And then down here she highlights even more what she's been able to work on. Um, and then her technology, so the technology that she's familiar with, um, as well as a, a game that she designed. More things that she's put together. And then she ends with her skills, programming languages, and then her LinkedIn profile. Um, so going into an interview with something like this is definitely going to make you stand out. So something that we still really value um, and use. And then I'll show you a sample. 
campus presentation. So for this, every student is put into a group and they uh, will be assigned a different campus resources, resource, so something around campus. So this group was assigned the Student Recreation Center. So they went and they took photos or they snagged them from the website um, and gave an overview. So they present this to the class uh, to be able to show them about other areas on campus that they can visit. So they used a lot of glide shows in here. Um, and then they were able to show where to find this location on campus, any relevant information, and then that they should use it overall. Um, any questions um, on that? We've really enjoyed working with the ID department um, here um, and the 300 faculty have really enjoyed the challenge of how to integrate technology into uh, the classroom and we have just had a really great time. If you have this space uh, and you have the desire to change, I highly encourage you to. Uh, my students definitely benefit a lot from me adding this technology to the classroom. Yes. Last of all, I, I'm faculty at Cal State uh, Long Beach. Mm -hmm. I downloaded the whole creative suite and use Spark and I'm not much of a tech person. I cannot believe how easy it was. To, and, I, and I set up a web page. It took me yeah. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, throwing a few pictures and a couple of links. It was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. It was so simple. Yes. Can yeah. you repeat the question? They can't hear it on the video. Oh. Uh, my. Oh. <laughs> I just want to say that I, I uh, downloaded a. a the creative suite last fall as faculty member, and I opened up Spark, and in 30 minutes I had a new web page. It was a no-brainer. So, yep, yeah, there's a question from the Any chat. Any other pod. questions? Question from the chat pod from Daniel Sutko. Oh, sorry. So presuming instructors don't have access to rooms with technology in which they can teach these skills, how do we hold students accountable? How do we teach students these skills? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, for us, my uh, classroom doesn't have computers. We had to rent out a separate room. So we went to our library uh, to be able to host that technology um, component of the classroom. So that's how we were, we were able to do it. Um, also, the computer labs on our campus have the Adobe software, so if they needed to work on it, they were able to do it on campus. So not all of our students have laptops with access to that, so we were able to put the resources on campus for them to use. Yes. <laughs> not used to microphone, though. Uh, so uh, I think it's very appealing, and I liked it a lot. Uh, but I, I do have a question because uh, some of my students actually have uh, visually impaired impairment. So I guess I always encounter a situation like that. So I kind of roll back to the very basic technology because of the JAWS compatibility. So I'm wondering is, if Spark is fully accessible for people with disabilities. That's a uh, correct answer. No, it's not. It's partially accessible, and we're continually working on it. Um, there is a Adobe accessibility page that you can all go to to see exactly what we cover, and there is an area there specifically covering Spark. Um, but again, to that extent, I mean, it, it isn't 100% accessible. The video tool, I'd say, was probably one of the, the ones that um, is the most accessible or accessibility friendly since you can pull down a video MP4 and put captions on it and et cetera. But um, again, we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, this semester I actually have a student who is visually impaired. Um, so I will be navigating that challenge this semester to uh, find an alternate assignment. What would be beneficial for that student to be able to use the technology? Sometimes it's not always possible. And as an instructor, you have to find a way for them to be able to still build the skills um, and So, question, follow-up question. Actually, can you share what kind of 
alternative assignment you will assign to your students who visual impairment in their class. Um, so we haven't gotten to Adobe this semester just yet. Um, so once I build them out, I'm more than happy to share, um, but it will be built on a different platform. I'll be working with our Disability and Support Services office um, to help create something that's going to be beneficial uh, for him as well. Any other questions? I can see if I can play it. Um, so every student was a little bit different. This student uh, didn't want to be on camera, so she chose oh. just other pictures. Um, but a lot of them did uh, just recorded themselves being able to say it. So she weaved in a little bit more of her work um, within her um, elevator pitch. Um, other students just talked about themselves and had just them in a suit. Any other questions? Yes. Perfect. Great. Awesome. That is very helpful. Anything else? Uh, all right. Great introduce. I feel like it's the price is right. It's like run down. It's like game Plunko. That's the one I always liked. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Um, moving on, I would like to introduce Bonnie J. Williams Farrier to the stage. And for those of you online, a little bit of background information. Dr. Bonnie Williams Ferrier earned her PhD in rhetoric and composition from Michigan State University. Her research centers on issues in composition studies, including theorizing African American literature and rhetorical traditions, understanding the intersections of gender and language in relationship to black female discursive practices, applying the perspectives from critical race studies and culturally relevant pedagogy to issues of teaching and learning and highlighting new pedagogical approaches to literacy, which underscore the importance of carving out space for the cultivation and support of students' lived experiences and literary traditions as essential aspects to empowering writing instruction. Without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so excited to be here. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to the IT team. They have been so supportive of me. It's my fifth year here at Cal State Fullerton, and Amir and Matt, and I just met um, Sepeda this year, and she was so helpful to me. In fact, we um, picked out some of the pictures from our presentation the other day, and we chose this picture for the as the first shot, not just because the student is beautiful and smart, but um, we actually noticed after we chose it for those reasons that she had a cell phone in her hand. So I don't know if any of you noticed that. Super cool. Um, all right, just to give you a little background about myself, um, in addition to what you heard about my um, in the bio. I specialize in composition and rhetoric. I'm a professor in the English department. I'm also the English 101 coordinator for all of the um, first year writing composition courses. We have a number of about 60 courses in the, in the department. And um, also the coordinator for our professional certificate in teaching and writing in the English department. Um, just want to give you a little background on how I became a part of this um, particular project or this pilot at Cal State Fullerton. To incorporate digital literacies in the comp classroom, um, we started talking about this because traditionally in composition courses, um, they're housed in English departments. But um, I met Matt and Amir and um, got to know them a little bit better and told them a little bit about my background. I came from a program where we were a separate department. So um, my program was composition and rhetoric, and it wasn't housed in the English department. 
Um, a few years before I arrived, um, the program had actually separated. And so we had a number of professors there who were really excited um, about that particular shift and were dedicated to um, actually creating a name for ourselves in the field and a great reputation for our department. So we were introduced to a number of different tracks in the field of composition and rhetoric. And those are listed there. Um, some of them are listed uh, cultural rhetorics, digital rhetoric, professional writing, and critical studies in literacy and pedagogy are just a few of the tracks that students in the program were exposed to. I um, specialized in critical studies in literacy and pedagogy, so I had the opportunity to teach a lot of the um, first year writing courses while I was actually studying in the program. But the mentor for the TA program at that time was a young professor named uh, Bump Hallbritter, and he specialized in digital rhetoric. So obviously he taught a lot of us and trained a lot of us in digital literacies and how to incorporate that into our classroom. So he um, introduced us to the Remix Project at that particular institution. So the Remix project that he introduced was the most noted assignment um, that we shared across our curriculum. And we all adapted it into our classrooms to meet the needs of our students and based on the themes for our courses. So um, in my course, um, a focus or a theme is often literacy. And so students complete four different assignments, and that's what's listed here. Um, the first assignment, the literacy autobiography, is a narrative about their experiences with literacy acquisition. The second writing assignment is the cultural literacies essay, which is a research paper that's typically about a non-traditional literacy skill that students have acquired. And then the disciplinary literacies paper is another research paper um, in which students explore how reading, writing, and research functions in their particular discipline or major of study. Do you have a question? Can we make this larger? Sapita or Matt? She wants to make the screen larger. OK. Yeah, this should be available to you so you can pull it up on your computers. That was a question I had. You should have access to it. And there's going to be a few other documents in here that are very small. So if you want to actually see the text larger, go ahead and pull that up now. Thank you. Thank you for raising that question. OK, so the Disciplinary Literacies Essay is a research paper um, in which students explore how reading, writing, and research is conducted in their field of choice. And then finally, the Digital Literacies Project is a group project in which students transform one of those previous papers into a video or a documentary. So some of the benefits of conducting a remix project in your class, especially as maybe um, you, you don't have to wait till the end of the class session to incorporate this group project. Even if you start in the beginning of the class, you know, making it one of like the first or second projects that students start to engage, um, it allows the students to contribute to the campus community in a number of ways. So. I just have a list here that I'll kind of read through really quickly. Students begin to understand the power of working in groups or collaborating with their peers. They're able to identify and access campus resources needed to make the project a success. They're engaging real world application of texts and meeting expectations outside of academia. They compose in genres other than the traditional academic paper. They get practice in composing across the disciplines in which they learn how to use alternative forms of media, which makes them uh, more marketable when they enter the job market. It teaches students that alphabetic text is not always appropriate for every composing situation. And then it raises issues related to permissions and other concerns that help students begin to think about citation practices related to expectations for academic integrity.
So another part of the course, um, I was asked to kind of talk about how I integrate this into the writing curriculum. Um, we explore not only literacy, but how to um, engage rhetorical concepts in academic writing. And so some of those strategies that I talk about in the composition classroom can also be applied to the remix project. But um, we begin to write our papers and think about reading academic texts, not just writing, but also reading academic texts in these ways. So students are expected to engage revision strategies, and that's just not the idea that you're revising a paper for grammar or spelling. But from, as a rhetorical concept, that's the idea that you're writing a paper or composing a project to inspire change or kind of contribute to um, changing someone's mindset about an issue or even inspiring them to take action. Arrangement is a strategy that's not just about organizing an essay, but comparing and contrasting. So um, how are things being put in relationship with one another? Encouraging students to use integrated reasoning listening and reading other arguments about a topic, synthesizing information. So that's, an arrange, that's considered an arrangement strategy. Invention is a rhetorical structure um, that causes students to just ask the question when they're composing about what they have to do to create that particular text. So did they conduct research? Did they reflect on personal experiences? Did they engage observation? Did they conduct interviews? Did they use alternative media to develop their projects? So what actually had to be done to compose this particular project? There should be a process there. Delivery um, is just asking the question or thinking about what delivery options are available, what media options are available or should be used. And this is when students can think about composing um, across the disciplines. So um, a couple of questions they might ask is, should the paper be delivered as a newspaper article? Or um, should the topic be delivered as a blog post, a script for television, a journal article? Um, there are a number of options available. So just kind of having a conversation about that. And then finally, style. Um, is the tone direct or indirect? Does the project include questions, rhetorical questions? If narrative is included, how much narrative should be included or is it necessary? Should we use first person? Is the writer embedding quotes in the text? So there's a number of style strategies that you can cover when talking about um, composing a, a, a project in a composition course. So these rhetorical concepts, um, they can be used across the disciplines and beyond. And so when students start to compose the remix project, we continue to have that conversation. And they're expected to utilize these um, rhetorical uh, constructs or these rhetorical um, strategies in their composing process when they create that video or that documentary or any other form of alternative media. So this is um, an assignment sheet that's available to you. I'm not going to read through it, but um, the long and short of it is when students engage the remix project. So now they're let's say they've create they've um, completed the first three essays for the course, and now we're near the end of the semester. They are working on the remix project. They're expected to read and review the essays of their group members. So I often ask the students to bring in your favorite essay. Um, out of the three that we wrote in this class, bring in the one that you like the most. They read each other's essays, and then they choose an essay to transform into a remix, or which is a video or a documentary. And the rhetorical strategy that they would engage in that situation is that delivery strategy. So again, they'll start to consider and discuss um, which essay would be most effective or impactful if presented in that alternative format. And then um, they continue to compose using the rhetorical strategies that are listed above. So I have a remix project example here. And I wanted to play this short video. It's about three and a half minutes. I would like you to kind of think about those rhetorical strategies that I discussed and watch the video and see if you can identify if the students are engaging any of them. Any questions before I play the video about the strategies that I discussed? And if you have access to the handout, you can probably scroll back up to that and um, have that in front of you while you watch the video.
Do we have sound? Oh, okay. Can we go out? Sometimes Good. it does that, yeah. Okay, well, don't worry about it. Um, so I'll make the announcement. So we're not going to hear the uh, see the video, um, but I can tell you about it. So these students did a project. Um, obviously, the paper was about uh, cultural awareness versus cultural unawareness, and I will play it because it's um, I can kind of maybe talk through it. So. Um, here's the student who's um, kind of introducing the project, and he's kind of giving a description of what you're going to see. Um, and in this case, I thought this functioned, his, kinda, his narrative here, I thought this kind of functioned as um, a thesis statement. So he's kind of giving a little background on the topic or thesis statement or introduction to a paper. Um, should I go ahead and keep talking about it, or do you think yeah, I should wait, Matt? Should I wait? You just keep talking about it? Okay. So um, then you can see questions listed there. They kind of introduce some questions. They're having their um, friends talk, and these are um, students that are um, uh, exchange students. And so they're talking about their experiences with language and culture from in the US. And so um, they pose a couple of questions for them to respond to, and they're talking about it. Now, what I thought was really cool about this video was that these students are speaking in their um, native languages. So the captions are um, actually in English. So that was really cool. Um, and that, you know, that's something we would talk about in the class as a rhetorical strategy to engage the audience. Right. So I'm going to move on past the video now. So I'm just going to go back into the presentation here. All right, cool. OK, perfect. And there are, um, when you get a chance to view the videos, there are other examples that you can take a look at, too. So don't forget about this button down here. Um, we just weren't able to play most of the videos on YouTube. There are some that are in a Dropbox listed here. So please um, take a look at the student works. Really, really awesome in that class. OK. So, one-on-one -on -one assessment and expansion, I'm kind of bringing it to a close now. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my role as coordinator. I mentioned earlier that I'm the one-on-one -on -one coordinator for the um, English one-on-one -on -one classes. And one of my, in that role, one of my tasks is to assess the faculty syllabi um, every year and kind of look at all of the, um, the syllabi and code it for um, things that we would like to happen in our one-on-one -on -one classes versus what's actually happening there. And so um, one of the things that I coded for last year was digital literacy. So to see if any of the 101 instructors were incorporating um, a digital literacy unit in their syllabi or any form of technology or, or opportunities for students to compose an alternative media. And what I noticed was that there was a low percentage of participation um, amongst faculty in terms of students composing in digital environments and using these alternative forms. So um, the Adobe Premiere Pilot is really helping us present practical pedagogical application of digital literacy, which encourages our faculty to include multimodal forms of composing in their classes. And so um, some examples of that are um, 
some of our 101 instructors who participated in the pilot. They taught first year writing 101, and they also teach other classes like advanced college writing, which is like a 300 level course in our department. And I teach other advanced courses like um, my course, which is a 305 course for future teachers called English Language in America. And so in those classes, I begin to incorporate technology as well. Students don't do the remix project, but they are encouraged to create videos and group projects. And um, so I'm not the only one who's actually expanded some of these practices into my higher level academic courses. There are other professors, and we have um, stats on that in terms of folks who have decided to, who participated in the pilot, but decided to also expand it to their other academic courses. So I see that as a positive in terms of us moving in the right direction. Um, implications for future research. I just wanted to mention a little bit about the data collection and. Um, what I hope that we can do in the future is, um, and we've gotten a lot of support from the humanities department and from IT in terms of um, being able to get support and help to, to not only collect the data but also analyze it. And so I'm hoping that in the future we'll be able to identify when and where our first year writing students are using their digital literacy skills across campus in real world, world situations, even as they progress through the university. So if they're using these digital liter literacy skills that they use in the first year writing class, um, if they're using that in other courses, um, if they're using it in a community or, um, or uh, events or groups, employment opportunities uh, to assert themselves on social media to deliver projects in other classes. Um, positive results from our assessment might help provide funding opportunities to develop our first year writing program. So I know that was a question that someone had earlier from the previous presentation. Um, someone asked, you know, what if we don't have access or if we don't have technology? Um, positive results from other campuses who are actually incorporating it and using it in their program and are able to show expansion might provide more opportunities for us to develop these kinds of programs in our department. And then finally, um, faculty collaboration. Uh, faculty can start to come together to produce scholarship on our experiences with this pilot or with this kind of program in our classes. And we can talk about and enter the conversation in academia about how digital literacies can be utilized to help students um, revision their work in the context of using it to contribute to the community and to their peers' lives. So those are some of my hopes for the future. Um, Questions? Any questions about this? Yes. Yeah. We can pass around this mic. I have a number of students that are English language learners, even though they're juniors or seniors. Is it possible to use the Adobe system to, I don't know, add different translations, even in a typical lecture? where they can watch the lecture at home and click onto their particular language? Courtney? I, I think there are ways of doing that, but the, that would involve um, quite a bit of video work. I don't know if there's any unicorns, but I will say... Um, yeah. There's probably a way right now, if you gave me that problem, I would have to sit on it for a second. But I will say Adobe um, is doing quite a bit with AI that's called Sensei, and there's a lot that's being automated and being done very quickly. Um, and I think that'd be a great idea to take back to that team. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Um, I think we have other based on the test. Uh, um, a question that was raised about um, students in DSS or disability services. Um, a suggestion that I would give to Megan, and I'll probably pass this on to her later, but um, this project started out in the program that I was in. Um, it wasn't just a 
a documentary and video project. It was um, allowing students to engage any types of alternative forms of media. So in the beginning, when I started out using this project in the classroom, I had projects from students who did poetry. They transformed papers into poetry, um, music, songs. Uh, I even had students, some students create a quilt which was for a cultural literacies project, which I still have in my office. I just thought that was so amazing. And um, yeah, so, so in terms of um, alternative assignments or for students in that position, I think there's an awesome opportunity for that in this class. If there aren't any other questions, I will. Are there any questions? Any more questions? Cool. Well, thank you so much, that quilt. I want to come see that. And I love the idea, again, of, of community engagement and connecting back to the community. And I know a lot of the schools that I've had the privilege of working with now, I, I see a lot of those dotted lines, and, and I love it. I think it's so crucial. So next up, and I'm super personally excited about this one, um, we're going to shift from CSU Fullerton to our friends, even though they're not physically that far, we all know with traffic, it could be good two hours to Cal State LA. Um, so here with us now, we have Dr. Beverly Bondad Brown, and she serves as the Director for Academic Technology at Cal State LA. She provides strategic leadership to help implement and support a wide variety of academic technology tools. She manages the campus's instructional design team and consults with faculty on course redesign. She also oversees three high-tech active learning classrooms and facilitates faculty development workshops at Cal State LA's Center for Effective Teaching and Learning. Dr. Brown holds an MA in Instructional Technology and Media from a Teachers College at Columbia University and a PhD in Communication from UC Santa Barbara. Let's just make sure the tech is working. It wouldn't be a technology conference without technology problems, right? We just had to make sure we delivered. We'll be following up with so many resources, you're going to get really annoyed at my email and want to delete it, because there's going to be a million links. Yes, we're working. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk today. It's good that we had examples up front, because as you're thinking about incorporating technology into your class, I'm going to kind of talk about how people learn, how your students learn, um, and then give you a whole bunch of tips for, th you know, if you're thinking about integrating technology into the class. And this could be anything. This could be clickers. This could be a Spark project. This could be, I want to go hybrid. So hopefully this will be very practical for everyone. Um, I'm Beverly. I'm the Director of Academic Technology from Cal State LA. Is there no one from Cal State LA? here? Oh, woohoo! Okay. All right. So um, I work for our Center for Effective Teaching and Learning. If you're live tweeting right now, our, you can, we're at LA Seedle, um, and there's our center's email address. Um, and so basically our center, CEDL, works on faculty professional development. We do a whole range of things, not just technology support, but active learning. Um, you know, flip learning, hybrid online learning. We're working on inclusive pedagogy. We teach a workshop on how, you know, first gen student learning, um, and really all of it's wrapped in how people learn. Um, and so we've done a whole bunch of workshops all over the place, including other uh, CSUs. And so um, the, the biggest piece is we're really co-located. We're the faculty development center. Technology are not all in one center. So faculty can come for either of those, and typically those are meshed, right? And so they come to one center, and we provide support um, for a whole range of things. So that's kind of helped us really you know, cement ourselves um, with faculty on our campus. So again, today I'm going to talk about how people, your students, and you learn. Um, you know, we'll talk about some, um, you know, what it means to assign a technology product, what that means, why you should do that, and then I'll talk a little bit about teams research because typically a lot of this are these are team projects, and so you may find that sometimes that really falls apart. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how to maybe not let it fall apart. Um, and most of this is really from this book, How People Learn. It's a meta study. Uh, it's free to download. You can just Google How People Learn, and you can find the full PDF of the whole um, study. And so there's basically three key things that they found on how people learn. And so I'm going to go through that for you. OK, so the first thing has to do with prior knowledge um, and the role that pl 
prior knowledge plays in learning. And so if I were to just say, hey, if I say cardinal, what do you think of? St. Louis. Yell it out. Come on. St. Louis, Bird, Redbird, Stanford. Ooh, I'm more of a Bruin. <laughs> um, all right, so some of you write red, St. Louis Cardinals. What about? Oh, right, it depends on kind of your prior knowledge, your prior experience. If you're Catholic, maybe you really thought, you know, Cardinal. Um, what about battery? Toys? Car? This is really super interactive, so just yell out your answer. Laptop. All right, all right, right? Thank you. You guys are going to participate today, just so you know, right? Yeah, a lot of people think, oh, battery, like, you know, in a device, right? But there's other thoughts. There's other, you know, ways, definitions, right, for battery. Anyone a baseball fan? Right? Like, I had to ask my husband, is that a thing? I, you know, I don't know, right? There's a lot of different things. And again, this really is based on your prior knowledge, your experience, right? And what you've been exposed to that's really going to impact your learning. Um, and so I'm here to say prior knowledge is powerful for you and your students, and it matters. I'll, let, I'll give you a second to read that. So students have prior knowledge, and if you don't engage that, they will write what you want on their test or in their assignment, and they will revert right back to that prior knowledge that they had before coming into your course. OK? So we're going to do clickers, which you're going to use your hand. Um, if you, and those of you in Zoom land should you know, participate in this as well. Um, individual learners show preferences for the mode in which they receive information. So visual, auditory, right? If you think that's true, give me a peace sign. And if you think that's false, give me a hand. You're all going to play. Don't be shy. Thank you. All right, what about this one? We should design our course content to match our students' preferred learning styles. Raise your hands. Let me see, true or false? OK. Both statements are false. I hear us, right? Um, you know, it's not, research doesn't actually support the idea that we should be designing our curriculum for um, our students preferred learning styles, right? And so for some of you, you're like, yeah, Beverly, sure. And you're just going to go right back to believing that, right? So concepts like learning styles, you know, the left, right brain theory, multiple intelligence are really not supported by research. And in some ways, there's a preference maybe, but we should not cater to that. We should actually, in some ways, challenge them in the other ways that they may not, you know, have that preference for learning. So think about that. Um, think about how we may, that may be, you know, one of our misconceptions and how we're going to, you know, fight that and, and think um, around that, right? Sorry about that. Okay. So, the other thing about prior knowledge is it could be wrong, like really, 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 really wrong, right? And so, um, if students have these misconceptions, like incorrect prior knowledge, they actually, again, will resist change. And so, you know, a common example, we have um, child and family studies faculty that come. Um, we have, they may have young um, mothers who are their students who culturally may think something like spanking is okay, right? That's accepted, and the research doesn't support that, right? And so a student may hear that, see the research, and think, okay, on your exam, I'm going to just say all that, but they may go right back to that, right? Because that's really their misconception, their prior knowledge, where they're coming from. And so you want to make sure that you understand that and then figure out how you can engage that. So the nice thing, right, is that that misconception is really where we can hook our students, right? That's the thing that you probably want to create your assignments or projects around. Get them at that right hook, and then that not only will spark their interest, but actually will deepen their students' learning. They actually will then change that misconception if you let them engage with that, OK? So these are just some general misconceptions. If you thought any of these were true, and I learned this one yesterday, a public health faculty came into my office and was like, can you print this exam? I'm teaching across the hall, and I don't have an extra copy. And I glanced at it and 
Um, cancer is not the most common cause of death in the US, which I didn't know. It's actually heart disease, um, right? So if any of these <laughs> are what you believe right now, those are actually all misconceptions, right? OK, and I'm a comm PhD, so more communication isn't necessarily always better. If you have a spouse, you know that, right? <laughs> All right. OK, so thinking now, huh, what misconceptions do students have about maybe your own class or assignment? Is this the mouse? I'm just going to move this thing. OK, and so here's some I've actually heard about me. Oops. This one for sure I've heard, right? This one. There's a librarian I heard in the audience. That one, right? Sometimes this one. And then this one, right? When am I going to use blah, blah, blah in the real world, right? And so um, that's actually where these are all the things you want to engage your students and kind of break that misconception. So what I want you to do, just take a few seconds to think about a situation where maybe you've experienced in your own class a student's misconception that dominated their ability to learn. Go. I think you guys all got these cute little notebooks. You know, if you want to just kind of jot that down. I'm sure all of you have encountered misconceptions in your class. I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to think about that and maybe then think, oh, how could that maybe be turned into an assignment or an activity? And if you're in Zoom land, go ahead and put it in the chat if you'd like to share. I'll read them all later. Does anyone want to share? Come around with the mic. Thank you. Uh, a common misconception I find in my writing classes is students in engineering or the sciences who think that once they're done with that class, they'll never have to write again the rest of their life. If only they knew how we all write like every single day, right? Well, this is more about pedagogy, I think, but um, my students seem to think that the only way they can learn is if I just stand up there and talk the entire hour and 15 minutes. That lecture is the only way that they can learn. Thank you. Uh, I spend a lot of time in active learning conferences, and I literally sit in my seat listening to a bunch of people lecture at me in active learning conferences, which I find <laughs> totally ironic. And so again, my goal is to keep this really interactive and to engage um, you know, the audience. All right, good. So what I, you know, I have some parts where you kind of reflect and think and talk and chat. And so hopefully I'm trying to kind of guide you towards thinking about how some of these thoughts can lead you to, you know, a nice project, right? Or an assignment. OK, now having said that about student misconceptions, you want to also think about instructor misconceptions, things like these. Right. And this one, especially if you're thinking about technology where, oh, students will go just figure out that, sec you know, that software. They, they, they totally know software. They'll pick it up. They're techie, right? They were born, right, born with you know, devices in their hands. And I'm here to say students probably can get like user interface if it's a really easy app that's designed and studied, right? But they can't just like pick up any, <laughs> you know, software. And so, you know, be mindful of that and not just to say, go away and create a presentation in X and give no guidance around that because that is not the true that they can just sort of pick that up, right? Um, and so again, thinking about this, try to be mindful of when your own, right, as an instructor's prior knowledge may impact your ability to teach and or your students learn, right? Um, okay. So 
We talked about prior knowledge and the role that prior knowledge plays in how uh, people learn. And I'm going to talk now about experts and novices. There's a difference if you didn't remember or know. OK, so experts, you're all experts in this room. If you teach anything, you're you know, imparting that knowledge on our students, you have some expertise, right? And so the difference is that experts have this vast knowledge of the content, and it's well organized, right? So if you think of a closet, everything's neat and, and tidy, and it's all color coordinated, it's very organized, right? And you also recognize patterns. You, can, you, know, you, you know patterns in your discipline or in your um, content area. And then, not only that, so you know stuff, you recognize patterns, but the organization of that, right, you can like grab that information really easy. You know how to like get that answer, right? I'm going to first shout out, this is, this is not my way of displaying all this. This is Peter Newberry's. And if you are live tweeting, you can uh, tell him I'm stealing his stuff. That's his handle. Um, but when you think about Experts, experts in knowledge, they have all of this knowledge kind of out there in their head, right? And then they have, the other part of this is this expert framework. They actually like know how that knowledge is organized, right? They have a system for how that knowledge is organized. And if you think of any of you in your own disciplines, you actually understand that. That's like why you went to get a PhD in that, right? So you really understand the framework of how that learning, how that discipline, whatever sits in the framework of everything else, right? And so there's the knowledge and there's the framework. And you actually can actually retrieve that efficiently. You know the way to like get to that piece of knowledge, right? Um, because you've been in it for so long. But you also know there's other paths to getting there. So you think of like if you're still, you know, learning a new piece of software, you might like know how to copy and paste because you can go to the menu, right? Edit menu, copy and paste. But you can also do the control things. You can also right click, right? You, you just know there's multiple ways of getting at that answer. Um, but you're an expert, right? And so you really know also what you don't know. But students who are novices don't have that. They don't have all that. They only know the one path to get to that. I only know that you go to the edit menu and do copy paste. I don't know you could do the hand thing, you know, whatever, everything else. And all of that knowledge is not fully formed. So that's something you have to just keep in mind. We call it the expert blind spot. You sometimes forget that students don't know that because you've been an expert for so long. And so you really kind of have to think about that expert novice gap. Um, same thing, if it, like I said, if a student's using, learning a new technology, you're probably a whiz at it, right? They don't know all of those things that you know, and so some of this is just about being transparent to students, right? Explicit, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so again, expertise, right? If you want to get a student from being a novice to an expert, they have to under, have that deep understanding of all that content knowledge, right? They have to actually understand how that's all arranged, right? And then they have to kind of organize it so they can get to that knowledge easy, right? Questions? You guys good? All right, I'm going to do a little quiz. Oh, OK, so this is, sorry, this is experts, right? There's all these clothes in the closet. They can mix and match outfits. They know what matches and what goes with what, right? And this is students, right? They have the stuff. You give them the content, and they know the stuff, but they're not quite sure how it goes together. Maybe they can get one outfit together, but they can't do like the multiple you know, gazillion outfits that you can do. And so really think about that when you're designing things, when you're teaching, right, about the difference between you as experts and what your students know. OK, oh. So think now for a second. Well, what might be the implications of everything I've just said about extrovert novice differences to you um, on your teaching and maybe on your students' learning? So I'll give you a couple seconds to just think about that and jot some notes down. Hopefully, you've found some ways to maybe improve what you're doing in your class. 
Anyone want to share? Thank you. So you need to use like metacognitive strategies to, yeah, <laughs> to model your own thinking. I didn't pay her. I'm going to talk about metacognition next. Anyone else? Well, I teach a health promotions theories course, and I assigned this semester a skill building activity because they weren't doing a good job of connecting the dots and creating that framework, but I'm not providing a good enough framework for them to be able to connect the dots with the assignment instructions. I didn't pay him either. I'm going to talk about that too. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Anyone else have like insight into what I'm going to do next and want to share? <laughs> Okay, all right, great. I'm gonna like address both of these things, so I'm super happy. And I don't know if there's anyone in, I don't know, on Zoom that's chatting it that wants to contribute, but we'll try to break in and check every now and then. All right. Okay, so I'm your instructor. Everyone, there's an important new number system. Please learn it. Go. There's gonna be a quiz. This is also from Peter Newberry, so I think if you say his name three times, you could steal any stuff that they do. OK, test. Who knows the answer? Yell it out. Five. Five. <laughs> it's not five. There's three digits. Come on, people. How did you not? We studied this. I, present, I lectured on it. How are you not able to do this? All right. Oh, I forgot. Here's the structure of what it is. Hopefully, you all know tic-tac-toe. OK, quiz. What's this number? Three, one, six. Look it. I'm like a master teacher. I just taught you guys all a new number system. Right? Good. <laughs> There's a five somewhere. All right. What made you learn that new number system? The framework, exactly what you were talking about, right? The organization, what else? What's number one? OK, what else? It was like the number one thing I talked about before. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So prior knowledge, right? Also, you, if, what if you've never played tic-tac-toe in your life? That wouldn't have helped you at all anyway, right? And so again, it's making explicit that structure, the organization, which sometimes as experts, we totally forget to do to students. We just stand up there and go, you got to learn this. And I'm telling you, because you have to just learn it. And we don't make clear, like, why am I learning this? And you know, maybe a mnemonic device or something that I can help students how they can actually learn it, right? And so think about that. Think about, as experts again, how we can kind of make clear or relate to their prior knowledge, right, the content that you're sharing with them. OK, we did some thoughts. Thank you. OK, so novice learners need to understand that structure and the goals of your course and its content, right? So not just, hey, everyone, we're going to organize everybody's closets at the end of this. And you have all the clothes. Go. Organize your closets. Go, right? You have to actually show them the blueprint. And our goal, everyone, is to use these different hangers. And we're going to try to color coordinate, right? You have to actually make that clear to students. Otherwise, they're just going, I'm supposed to like hang clothes, <laughs> right? And not know what you're expecting, right? And so again, think about your students who are novices, right, in your discipline, in your course, in your content. Um, and how you can help them, help them understand that structure and the goals of your course. OK. So novice learners need to practice. And they'll make mistakes, right? That's OK. That's like the assignments you're giving them. That's like the projects you're having them do. That's what you're doing in class, ideally, right? That's the practice. And so the word about really practicing 
those misconceptions, engaging their prior knowledge, letting them understand the structure, all of that, those are the things you want to practice. And those ideally are the kinds of things that should be those assignments and projects. And, and so someone earlier was sort of like, you know, just, I think it was Kathy, right? Like just sort of having, in, in, adding technology to the class. Well, you want to also be purposeful about the kind of projects you're asking them to do and that they're actually purposeful and engaging prior knowledge and the things that they really need to like learn, right, to be experts. Questions? Okay, what is it? I'll run back there. I should run my tennis shoes. I'll let you read it a little bit more. Okay, uh, Daniel says, uh, when it comes to tech, students often message questions they could easily Google. Turns out they don't like it when you tell them to Google it. <laughs> What's a good non-face-threatening way to explain to students that they should and shouldn't Google without coming across like you're not open to content or any questions? The way I see it, learning to use search to answer questions is essentially for digital literacy and autonomy. So they don't like, so students don't like when we say Google it. I mean, I have like a nine and 11 year old and they ask me questions and I say Google it. I think, <laughs> you know, the, the, the learning landscape has changed. It's why there's this shift towards active learning um, because no longer am I the expert that stands at the lectern and there's no other way you're going to get my content except for me to like lecture you. So students are actually uncomfortable probably with some of the changes, even as we've gone into active learning in our classrooms. Um, you know, students are, are wanting the right answer. And so when you're like, hey, work on this project, or work in a group and answer this question, I've had students literally come and like practically shake, you know, my arm and go, can you come over here and tell me if this, if our answer is right? And they can't move on to, to not. So, um, I don't want to diverge into a whole other area, um, but there's some research, and I forget, I think it's Perry's levels of sort of understanding, and so, you know, the first one is where students think that there's just right and wrong answers for everything, and if any of you have done a dissertation, you know that's not true, <laughs> um, and so we have to kind of get to the next level of really understanding and supporting their argument, right, with the right evidence, because that's really what things are about, not a right or wrong answer, but what the evidence is showing. So that's my short answer. Um, but if you have any other questions, um, those of you in Zoom, I'm happy to answer those um, via email as well. OK. Here is another poll. Reflection is a powerful form of practice which leads to greater learning. True or false? Just think of your own prior learning. Right? Mostly trues in here, right? True, right? Reflection is really great because it has to engage their prior knowledge and makes them have to actually articulate out like what they know is true and what you've just presented to them, right? And so particularly they have to actually think about their direct experience with whatever, like the couple reflections I've asked you to do, right? Think about your own direct experience and how you really feel about that prompt. So if you're not adding reflection to your course, you should. Um, that's really where really deep learning happens, right? Because you're really confronted with that. Wait, they told me this, but is that really how I understand it to be, right? And so to not have students, pa even in your own class as you're lecturing, right, or, or teaching, um, building in reflection is, is powerful for students. OK, this is my meta reflection, because you're going to reflect right now about reflection. <laughs> What is a practice activity you can assign that will challenge your students' prior knowledge and allow them to synthesize or articulate a key lesson or concept in your course? So think for a second about this. Can you, what can they practice that allows them to kind of reflect on what you just said and, and something that they have to think about? I'll give you 30 seconds. And go ahead and chat with your neighbor about it. See what you both come up with. I'm going to walk around and make sure you actually do it. Maybe Zoom people can chat out to, you know, their reflections.
right, make sure both parties have shared a little bit. Who wants to, oh, I hate to break up the conversation. I should have brought a bell. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> uh, and, and those of you in Zoom, I just joined the room, so hopefully I can see what you guys are saying. I see Barbara Taylor's on. Any thoughts that you want to share with the rest of us? What? Yes? Let's see. Is there anyone that hasn't shared yet that would like to share? Okay. I'm really good at wait time, too. That's the thing. Okay. Um, I only... Okay, let's see. Someone, Jennifer Lars from Long Beach. Hi, Jennifer. Said, I'd like... To, I also encourage faculty to direct students to the library for resources or use resources from the library on how to search for items they don't know about. Part of learning is exploring on their own without always having a guide. I'm going to talk about this in metacognition. Thank you for saying that. Um, Christine Clemens said, when I cover graphic organizers, I ask students to first go find someone on Google, then I ask them to paste them in a Google slide. Then we discuss why they chose the item, and we talk then about the use of graphic organizers. They show me first what they think, then we elaborate. Great. Someone, it sounds like, is talking about using maybe Slack in the class. Um, anyone in the room want to share? I'm going to cold call the next question. Uh, this goes back to my theories of health promotion classes. Students of, uh, in the health sciences track have probably tried changing a behavior at some point in time and, and just kind of struggled through it. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. And so maybe at the start of class we could talk about, um, before we do the in-class activity, have them reflect on a previous behavior change that they've tried and how similar or different it is from the theory that we're discussing that week. Awesome example. I sometimes teach calm theory at our uh, campus, and you know that just sounds scary, right? Communication theory. Um, and so when we talk about persuasion theories, a good start is to just be like, hey, you know, not even going into any content. What was the last ad you guys actually like really read, right? Like looked at and scrutinized, right? And we'll go into like um, elaboration likelihood model, and so. Before you even give content, you just have them really reflect. And then I could actually tie the examples that they share. So someone was like, there was a video game ad, and like, you know, went on and on and on about how they scrutinized it, and they debated if they wanted to buy the video. And then as I was sort of explaining in the class, I kept tying it to like, and the video game thing, and then the way that he was reading the price, right? And so that's a really good way, again, to have them think about their prior knowledge, what you're now telling them about whatever the concept is, and how they're now connecting that with what they know. Great. Great. OK. I think I put this somewhere. All right. OK. Someone said metacognition, which is awesome, because that is the next sort of key finding. Um, Right, metacognition, and we used to do a lot of faculty development workshops, of course, redesign around metacognition, and we'd go, you know, what's metacognition? And someone would say, thinking about thinking. We'd be like, yeah, oh, great, you all know what it is, right? Okay, and we'd move on. <laughs> and we would realize after, like, well, everyone could figure out what metacognition is, right? Meta of cognition, cognition about cognition, whatever. Um, but they really didn't know, and no one was really going, okay, can you explain it a little bit better? So hopefully I will try in a non-boring-ish way to kind of very high level talk about metacognition. Okay, so the reason metacognition is so important is because it actually works to bridge that expert-novice gap, 
right? And so if you're incorporating metacognitive strategies um, into your course, students will actually not only understand that better, right, but the, it'll actually increase the degree of transfer. So transfer is what like psychologists really, really want to happen, right, where you learn something in one way and then you could transfer it to a whole other different like, you know, area or scenario, right? So you're not just memorizing that thing, you actually know, oh, that really applies in this other way, right? So kind of like the two different, you know, knowledge things, right? I learned it one way, but I could also apply it to this other way. Okay, I had fun looking for clip art yesterday. <laughs> All right, so metacognition, and there's a lot of variables, a lot of dimensions, the research, you know, there's a lot of research on this. I'm gonna kind of like dumb it down in a way that like I could explain it. <laughs> so you wanna think there's kind of these three areas, right? There's stuff about the person, there's stuff about the task, and there's stuff about their strategies. And so, um, you know, the person stuff is really a student recognizing their own strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, the task stuff is, you know, what a student may know or can figure out about the task, what's required, what your assignment is trying to get them to do, right? And there's strategy variables. And I'm happy to share these slides with everyone after, so, um, you know, I, I appreciate the photos, but I'm happy to give you all slides, of, uh, you know, share the slides. Um, and then the strategy variables are the ones that, you know, the, the strategies that the student has to really accomplish that task, right? And so um, what we can do as instructors is help students plan, right, help students evaluate, and help students monitor their learning. So if we can kind of help students do all of these things, they'll get better at metacognition. They'll get better at planning. They'll get better at evaluating themselves, right? They'll get better at monitoring their own learning, and that's really gonna help sort of bridge that gap. And someone was talking about, uh, this is going to help with that transfer so that they can answer this question and then they can also go figure out strategies that they can apply somewhere else and answer that question. So we're not just always like spoon feeding them, right? They'll be able to be more self-sufficient on their own. So that's why metacognition is also really powerful. Okay, so just some examples. Um, helping to plan, a stu th these are the questions a student would ask, you know, if they were, um, metacognitive, right? Like, okay, if I have an assignment, oh, what am I supposed to do? They would clearly know what they're supposed to do. They would know how PK's prior knowledge, how their prior knowledge will help them. They'll know what they'd have to do first, let's say, right? They know much, how much time they need, thank you so much, um, to do that assignment, right? Um, helping them monitor, they would be able to be like, okay, I know, how am I doing, right? Am I on the right track? Right? What if I don't understand? What should I do? They're monitoring their progress. And to help them evaluate, they would be able to know how well they're doing, how well they did turning that thing in, right? What they learned. And then that, again, apply this, this content into another situation. And so there's ways that we can build um, metacognition into your coursework, your projects, your class, right? To help students learn and then be more self-sufficient. Okay. Who's like, Beverly, what are you talking about? <laughs> I have no idea how that's supposed to help me. So I'm going to help you. <laughs> Sometimes metacognition looks like this. So a student who can actually answer all these things are probably more metacognitive, right? They actually know learning goals for their class. They actually know that they learn better at X o'clock versus, you know, morning or night, let's say. They actually, you know, know, OK, I set aside time to do my studies or to do homework, right? They, they, they know that they need to do that. That's the planning piece, right? They know maybe if there is a group project, they know their strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, they know what to do if they don't understand an assignment. And that could vary. It could mean I know I need to go to office hours or I need I need, know I need to, you know, um, ask a friend who's taken the class. I know, you know, whatever that is, they actually have a plan to ask for right for help um, blank helps me stay on top of my coursework that could be you know a checklist or my calendar or you know whatever they actually have something that helps them they know you know oh I could read but I can't read if I'm in a Starbucks or I can't read if you know I'm in a super quiet library right there's different ways that people like to study 
or you know, even something like, I know it's going to take me x hours and x minutes to submit this assignment. Students that are highly metacognitive actually know these things about themselves, and they're able right, to plan and monitor and evaluate how well they're doing in the class. And that's the piece that we have to encourage in our students. We have to help them kind of be metacognitive to be successful. OK. So how do you go from this without, I guess you could take this and make everyone fill this out and then have them think about it. But I'll talk a bit about how this will help in your teaching. First, organization, having really clear and organized instruction is actually a high impact practice on its own. So if you're someone who just kind of wings it and you kind of, you know, just I'll figure that when I'm going to cover, you know, next week. That's not helpful for our students. And it's particularly not helpful for first gen students, first generation college students. Cal State LA has one of the highest numbers of first gen students. And so we take that seriously. And so, you know, to help support your students, and I'm sure across all the CSUs, there's a lot of first gen students, just being clear and organized is helpful. Okay. The other thing is, um, Clear criteria that specify what success looks like. That's super important for our students. More so than teaching methods and the mode of instruction. So more so than if you're going to lecture or do active learning or whatever, just specifying your criteria is helpful, is more helpful <laughs> for your students. Um, questions? I had another thought that's. Oh, I was going to say, so this is what we call in your head grading. A lot of times we're like, I, I know what a good paper looks like. I, I just know, when I just like come across a good project, I know that's an A and I know another project is a C. That's not helpful for your students, right? They have no idea what you mean by it's an A paper or it's a C paper, right? I'm looking at a writing person going, right? You're, she's nodding her head, so I'm so happy, right? So that's where you really have to like specify clear, explicit criteria for what you say is an A paper, what you think is a B paper, right? What you think is a C paper, because that is what and that will help students actually like plan and monitor and evaluate themselves, right? Okay, so think back to, and I'm going to challenge you to think back to undergrad. How many <laughs> classes do you remember your teacher giving explicit instructions about how an assignment would contribute to your learning? And so you could, you could have two hands if you think it's like 10 or more. If you think it's really like, I don't even remember undergrad, you could just do your fist. Let's see hands. <laughs> People are like not even putting their hand up. They're like, that never happened to me. <laughs> All right. Um, I see Christine Clemens' question in here, and I'll get to it in a second. OK, so it's probably like, if, you, if those of you not in this room, maybe one person's fist went up, and nobody else had any hands. So I'm going to think that that like, never existed, right? Um, OK, and, the, and we're going to all agree that the teaching learning landscape has changed. So we're not going to do what we, you know, we did in undergrad. OK. <sighs> So we have to really think about right expectations. I didn't find this picture. My boss did, and so it's the funniest thing. That's like my kid. My kids the same way. You like want them to smile, and they're like not. That's a smile for them. Okay. <laughs> and if you think, well, where do we set our expectations? Okay, it's probably in the syllabus somewhere, but it's like vague, and it's kind of like you're gonna do well, right? Um, so I'm going to be an advocate for transparent teaching methods. And if you don't know what transparent teaching is, it's out of UNLV, uh, Marianne Winkles from there, who I think she's leaving to another university now. But you can just Google transparent teaching methods, and there's a whole bunch of resources for you on transparent teaching. And transparent teaching methods is just generally about a whole bunch of things. But I'm actually going to push transparent assignment design on you. And this is particularly important when you go, hey, everyone, we're going to do a technology project in the class. I am challenging you to make that follow the transparent assignment design template. Um, I gave you a tiny URL, and there is a QR code for those of you in the room. Um, the link at the bottom has, a, again, a whole site full of resources for you. Um, and I'm going to just kind of, again, dumb down transparent assignment design and, and really argue why it's super great for our students. Okay. 
So the elements of transparent assignment design are where you're explicit about the purpose, what specific knowledge students will practice, or skills they'll practice, and the knowledge they'll gain. And I'm glad we actually started with a couple of examples of folks sharing what they have their students do. Um, the task, you know, what they'll do, how they'll do it, and criteria for success. So you need all of these components and not just, hey, all you're going to like make a thing, right? I sounded like I was from Texas right there. Okay. I'm going to go through this, right? Because the purpose is going to help them monitor, the task is going to help them plan, and the criteria is going to help them evaluate, and then you're going to help bridge that gap, right? Use metacognition to bridge the expert novice gap. Okay. So this could maybe be an assignment you've given. Hey, and <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be like a compositionist in the room, but you know, hey, do this topic and go to the library and then do a presentation and it's due on this date, right? Does that, who wants to admit that kind of looks familiar? I should have used one of my before uh, examples. Okay, and so I'm going to talk about how this can get transformed into a transparent assignment design. And it's actually a really good process. I just did this for just a discussion forum post that we want faculty to do in an online training. And, and at first I'm like, uh, this is my prior, I'm first like, if you give them all of it up front, they're just going to know and I'm trying to be sneaky and I don't want them to know what I, the goal of this discussion forum post is, but it actually made it better. <laughs> So um, if you're thinking, I don't want to give them all the information up front. I want to just see what they come up with. Don't do that. Just give them all the information up front, OK? OK, so first thing, <clears throat> you're going to talk about the assignment. You're going to remind students of the course learning objectives, which they probably don't even know because you just copy and paste that on every syllabus. But that's actually important. That's their learning goal. OK, and then you're going to give just that brief overview, which is probably what I showed you right before, right? Oh, you're going to create a thing, and you're going to you know, work in groups and on this topic or whatever, right? And so typically, like, that's what we, well, the second thing, this thing is what we do, right? Just the second bullet point is what we do now. OK, but beyond that, you're going to actually talk about the purpose. And these words are interchangeable. I don't like, the, like, for assignment, I'll say overview. For purpose, I, I'd say, like, what you're going to do, right? You don't have to use these terms. But you need all these sections. And so you're going to actually explicitly say how this assignment relates to the course learning objectives. You're all going to do this presentation or this speech because one of our course objectives is to explain a variety of communication theories and how they relate to the real world. That's what you're going to be doing in this presentation, right? You're also going to explain how the assignment will benefit their learning. This will give you practice for identifying theory concepts in real world interactions you know, for the rest of your life, right? And then you're going to indicate how those knowledge and skills are important to the students' lives. Because that's the piece we sometimes go, learn the new number system. Just do it, right? And they have no idea why they're doing it. So that's where you're going to say, and those of you like in the business school or in professional degrees, they get that. You're going to actually use this in the workplace. You're going to actually build you know, this when you become whatever, right? Or you really need to know, let's say, public health things because you're going to pick your own insurance plan when you're, whatever that is, right? You actually want to make that explicit so students know why the heck they're doing the thing you're asking them to do. OK? So this is where you will say specific skills that they'll practice. Practice, practice, practice. Right? And if you can use Bloom's verbs, Bloom's taxonomy verbs, that's better, not just you're going to understand, right? You're going to say, you'll be able to explain, you'll be able to compare and contrast, whatever those verbs are. Um, and then you're going to tell them, hey, the knowledge that you'll learn or use to complete this assignment so that they know, oh, I'm supposed to know what elaboration likelihood model is. I should probably go read that, right? So this is the first part, and it sounds daunting, but please know that when you sit down and do this, you actually will be like, oh, why? You'll either go, oh, why am I making my students do this assignment? It has nothing to do with my course at all, right? Or you actually will be like, oh, this is super valuable. You'll like convince yourself why this is like the best thing that your students need to do. Or you'll be in the middle and tweak it to get it to be the best thing your students will do. 
Okay, then you actually need to talk about the task. And this is something that we forget, right? Where we think students will just figure it out, right? And so specifically, you need to say specifically what the students will do, almost like a recipe in the order that they need to do it. So I've seen assignments where they're needing to go find an empirical journal article in the library, and then they're needing to read that and do something and then maybe argue something. And the you know finding an empirical article in the library database is like the bottom step. And then the students do like writing, outlining, writing the paper, and then at the bottom they go, oh, I was supposed to get an article, right? So you have to actually do it in like recipe order so that they're following the steps because they don't know, even though you said in the brief you know, description at the top that they're gonna use an article, they're following your steps, okay? If you're using the LMS, this is where you'll actually also say like, down below, click reply, or you know, down below, click upload a file where you actually are explicitly telling students how they're supposed to turn in your assignment, right? You're going to talk about that recommended sequence. You are going to say mistakes to avoid, like make sure your article is an empirical journal article and not a book review, right? Students may not like actually understand the difference. And this is key for students, this last bullet point, because you are an expert, right? The estimated time it should take to complete, if you can break it up into components, great. If you just are giving them a guesstimate, fine. And so for something, again, like a discussion forum post, and maybe I want them to reply to two other people, I'm going to say, it probably will take you 20 minutes to, to post a reflection and another 20 minutes to read and respond to two of your you know, colleagues or you know, students. You actually have to say that out loud, because they think they could just pick the first one and just start writing, right? Again, I use the research example because I've offered <laughs> that assignment where students go, oh, I'll just go into the library and you know, just put in your search word and you can find that like journal article, right? Where you have to actually say, it will take you at least an hour to, you know, to like read abstracts and find the right database and, and identify a correct journal article because students will think that'll take them like five minutes. Right? And so you as experts know it doesn't take you five minutes, <laughs> right? It takes you an hour to like sift through and make sure you're in the right database and you know, whatever. So that's where you need to actually let students know that and so that they can monitor their progress and they can plan accordingly. Oh, I need to set aside an hour because that's how long it's going to take me to find the right article, right? All right, questions? Yes. Oh, hold on. What you're seeing is much of what we try to cover, you know, on the first day of class or when we go through the syllabus. And I've always had my students, I'll do a quick overview of the syllabus and then the next time really get in details when they come to the next meeting. But I also think, since many of us are, are beat to death about all our syllabi have to be the same as everybody else, do you think it's important to actually read all those 18 objectives out loud? Okay, you're not gonna like my answer. If you have 18 course objectives, that's too many. <laughs> you should really have five, because if you're really having students practice, like to get to finishing or achieving 18, that's like a degree. <laughs> so we try to, you know, work with our faculty to if they can. So uh, this is a whole other conversation. I don't want to go into. I have an accrediting body, and they require me to say all 27, whatever. What we recommend um, when faculty, our faculty go through course redesign is you may have to kind of rename and refine. And, and I typically will go, my objectives for the course are, and I may specifically kind of craft very specific ones around what I'm trying to achieve because we may not get to like all 18. But, okay, uh, but 13 is a lot too. So, um, but here's the thing. I'm actually really talking about a specific assignment or project which means it could be a whole other handout with all these components. So not just your syllabus where you say we're going to do three papers and you know a presentation. I mean, where all of this is specific to one assignment. So that's kind of the difference. One more question. Yep. From uh, this perspective of the other librarian in the room, uh, <laughs> under task, we often find students have been given too much information, like they've told them to look at a specific database mm -hmm. that we no longer have, or the 
our, the, everyone in the CSU knows that we hope that we now have a new um, 23 campus online catalog and stuff like that, and yet we get assignments in that, that don't reflect that. So my recommendation, and this is not consulting with any of my own librarians, <laughs> is if, you, if, if librarian, librarians have like just even their own steps, which may have a blank for the database that's updated that you can easily share with your faculty, that's helpful. Or once you come across a student going, I need help, and here's the steps my instructor said, you know, reaching out to that faculty and maybe, because I don't know that faculty are always on top of the databases and they can change year to year. So it's really just kind of partnering and, and working with them to, to be sure and, and then letting the student know at this point we don't have that database, you know, so, but, but I still think more sometimes is better just because, not, you know, less is like confusion, so. Okay, and then because I also am the QA coordinator at our campus, the quality assurance coordinator, right, the other things you're gonna need to do is if you're using specialized software or technology, right, that, again, that could be clickers, whatever, you actually have to tell students explicitly in your syllabus where you get that. Don't just assume they know magically how to find whatever, right? Um, you, have, you should be saying technology skills required in order to utilize it. You should be saying, and hopefully your IT or your faculty development center or somewhere has some of this canned on their website maybe, um, the minimum technology requirements to even run that software. And I'm assuming, you know, if you have very highly specialized software as well, right? That, you know, so you may need whatever RAM or, you know, you may need what, whatever that is, right? And then you should be telling students where to go for help so that they can answer for themselves, oh, if I'm confused or I don't know where to download or I have an issue because it's not downloading, that they're not emailing you, <laughs> you're telling them where they need to go, whether that's the ITS help desk or your academic success center, wherever that is, Make that explicit as well in your syllabus, and you may want to add it to your assignment just so students know. Okay, and then the last piece is that criteria for success. You have to say, get, we say get out of your, in your head grading, the, the characteristics for that finished project. Um, it's helpful for students to see multiple examples and before, you know, someone goes, yeah, but then they just try to copy that one example that I give them. That's why I say multiple examples. And it could even be like, here's an A project. Like, let's say you're doing, you know, a, a online resume like we saw earlier. It's showing them the A and showing them the C and showing them, you know, whatever so that they're not just copying, you know, one thing. Um, and then indicate how it will be graded. And this is where rubrics are critical for students. Um, and then, as a bonus, if you're really you know, wanting the gold star, is after you give back the student their grade, have them reflect on their completed work and how they can improve it in their future work. And so this is true for even your midterm and your midterm exams, is if you don't know what an exam wrapper is, just Google exam wrapper, that's highly metacognitive for them to goal set for the next time if they didn't do well on that exam. Okay. So again, please, 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 please use rubrics because the, here's the thing. You're actually going to set the criteria for what you are looking for. And so like I get, I assign a paper in classes. I could care less about grammar. Like I'm not there to feedback them on that. I really want to see the, the arguments, right, and how they're supporting their arguments. So I'll kind of overlook that for a little bit. But if I don't make that clear to students, they're probably spending all their time making sure it's grammatically correct and not as much time like looking at how they're supporting their arguments, a rubric will actually not show here that I'm counting grammar in the grade. And so there's less confusion. They know exactly what I'm grading on and, and what that's worth. And so that's kind of that getting out of your, in your head grading. Yes. I was just going to ask if you have any good references for learning how to write a rubric. Well, our center has a lot. Um, you know, I uh, we could talk later. How about that? I'll stick around. Okay. All right. I'm going to go into team activities, and hopefully I won't go over, like, too long. But I feel like this is where, like, you feel like it breaks apart. You assign a team activity, and then, like, the team implodes, and you're like, I'm never doing it again, right? So these will be really quick tips to hopefully get you to do this right. Okay, 
You should only be using Teams when the task is knowledge intensive, the activities to achieve that task are actually interdependent, and you need different expertise or perspectives to actually achieve that task, to complete the task. So a good reason, a not good reason to assign a group project is because you don't want to grade a whole bunch of individual projects. That's like the worst reason, okay? So don't do that because typically that's where you're like, it's gonna be a group project. And one person can do that project and one person does that project and the whole group hates it, right? But you don't have to grade <laughs> individual projects. So as you're designing group projects in your class, make sure that you're designing it so that it needs to be a team to complete that project. Okay, that's like step one, and when you get to that, it should not implode. Okay. Here's another poll. A group composed of smarter group members will result in a smarter team. The people that shot their hands up probably go to meetings a lot <laughs> with administration, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> False, okay, average intelligence of individual group members does not produce a more productive team. So when researchers actually measure the individual intelligence of the group members and then look at how productive that team is, it doesn't mean the group with a whole bunch of really smart people are more productive than not, okay? So just know that, keep that in mind. All right, so what makes a, you know, quote unquote smarter team, and by smarter team, there's some research emerging right now in um, organizational um, research around this idea of this collective intel a general intelligence factor, this C. So I'm going to use C and collective intelligence interchangeably. It just means a more productive team, right, on a wide variety of tasks, right? So it's the ability for a group to just perform, you know, well on a bunch of tasks. So what predicts this general or collective intelligence in teams or productivity? It's not members' intelligence, I already told you that. It's not team satisfaction, cohesion, or motivation of the members. It doesn't matter if your team's totally cohesive or they're happy with the team or they're super motivated. That doesn't predict. It's not personality traits of individuals, so that has nothing to do in the research with if a team will be um, productive. It's actually the gender composition of groups. So here's my other question. What do you think? Teams formed with more women than men have higher collective intelligence. True or false? Raise your hand. Let me see those. Pretty much women are saying true. <laughs> the men aren't really playing. It is true. <laughs> Um, teams formed with more women than men in the research actually have a higher collective intelligence, but it's actually due to differences in the group interactions, and so there's like mediating, moderating variables for that, not just because women are awesome and productive, but for other reasons. <laughs> and I'll go through what that means. And so there's this idea that this, this female factor, right, is that women actually are higher on social sensitivity scales, which mean, and the way they test this is really crazy, they like show pictures of eyes only, and they tell, they act quiz you on like what those pe what that person is feeling and so women are more able to see just looking at eye pictures if that person's confused or sad or you know happy or whatever and so again women are better at at being more sensitive you know understanding emotion in these groups as well where there were higher proportions of women there was much more even distribution of speaking turns so it was much more kind of democratic where more group members actually talked um, and so that's also what contributed to the, um, you know, the, the higher productivity. And it was also obviously the diversity of that team composition in a, you know, mostly male um, group. They didn't perform as well just because of the diversity of like voices and, and thoughts and all that, right? And so that's why um, groups with more women actually did better. Okay, so how can, I, how can you use this in your class? Let me do this one last poll. Which of the following is the most effective strategy for forming, so this is no longer true or false, random groups or self-selected groups? So where students pick their groups or where students are randomly assigned? Raise your hands. Okay, we're all, well, <laughs> and a fist, they, they don't know. Okay, here's the answer. 
Research actually supports that you should randomize your groups rather than let students pick who they want to be in their groups because that they actually perform better, again, right? But purposeful teams where you as the instructor are actually purposely mixing them obviously is ideal and I get that that's not easy to do. So if it's between, if you're thinking between, oh, I'll just let students pick their own groups or I'm gonna randomize groups, they do better if you just randomize the group. So that's something you might think about. And your LMS may be able to kind of just randomize your, your participants in a second. Let me just get through the rest. I know you have a question, because um, I think I'm running a couple minutes over. So OK. <laughs> um, so this is where I give you sort of the practical advice for your team projects, right? You need to consider that team composition. Obviously, don't assume the smarter people make a smarter team. You should, for the groups, help establish some team norms so that all members can actually contribute to the project, right? Mimic that even speaking turns thing so that you're ensuring all the group members have a say. And again, that's really where stuff breaks down, right? When they think one person either is doing the whole thing or where they think, you know, people are social loafing in the group, right, and not doing anything. So make sure that you're saying, hey, everybody needs to contribute and build that in some way into something, right, into part of the assignment. Again, if you can increase the diversity of team members, again, and this isn't just like male and female. This could be their expertise, different personalities, um, sometimes um, situa like home situations. Uh, I've heard it where some faculty say, you know, everyone who has a full-time job um, over there and everyone who has um, maybe kids and other family responsibilities, hold on, and then you're evenly spreading those people out so that's not one whole group, right? You're, you're kind of not letting every group have, or one group just be like, we all work and we're never going to be able to meet, right? Okay. The other thing you need to do for team projects, again, is assign clear tasks for the group. And this is where your transparent assignment design comes in handy because they exactly see what's you know, asked of them. And then to define team roles. And so a lot of times you may actually, and you can just Google team roles in you know, higher ed or in college. And there's different things like who's, I don't like to say the leader or the manager, but I, used to, I like to say the coordinator, right? Um, and then maybe the timekeeper or you know, whatever you have um, at you know, the negotiator, someone who ensures that everybody's actually talking. So having those um, team roles defined will help also your team kind of take responsibility and do those things. OK, and again, only do team projects if these are all true. All of them, not just one of them. And then if you do all of these, all of this is really good for everything in your class, not just technology projects, not just, you know, any assignment, anything as we get closer to grad 2025. Grad 2025, where all of us are trying to increase in the CSUR graduation rates and lower DFW rates. And then I'm happy to stick around and uh, answer questions. I know there was one back here. Oh, OK. OK. Yes. 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 So if those of you on Zoom, just the practicing of the group roles and practicing, practicing gets them better learning skills. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm scrolling through Zoom. Um, and actually, I'm going to log in, so I'll be able to kind of scroll through the chat and answer questions if there was more out there. Yeah, one more question. I have a question. I have a suggestion. I use a name generator app that's free so that I remove myself totally from that process of putting my students into group because they have to do it in every class. So it, it's a free app. It's called Starter. I love sharing resources. Starter? All right. Thank you all for your time. And again, I'll stick around if you have other questions. Wow, thank you so much, Beverly. That was incredible. And let's just have another round of applause for all of our speakers this morning. It's been so interactive. And thank you to everybody in Zoom. There's been so many um, responses in there and questions. So we really appreciate you participating. 
We are still, uh, we promised you a 10 minute break and I know everyone wants to get up and stretch and get some coffee. Um, so let's go ahead and meet back here. I guess that would make it 1135-ish. And so for those of you online, if you wanna go stretch, get some water, whatever you need to do, we will meet you back here in 10, thank you.
So our next prisoner, and we're just getting set up here, but I want to go ahead and kind of tee this up. So the rest of the day, we are essentially in the hands of my good friend, Dr. Todd Taylor. And I, we are so fortunate that we were able to, it was a hard sell to have him come out to California to be with all of us here today. Although I kept, I kept promising him these days of sunshine. Of course, there was like a random lightning storm right when he arrived. Um, <laughs> snow? What? I just relocated from Los Angeles to the Bay Area, so, whoa, wow. What? That's, wow, that's cool. I did not know that. So while we are waiting, let me just um, shed a little light uh, on Todd's background. Todd Taylor is a distinguished professor of English and comparative literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he also directs the first year writing program. Since the early 1990s, his research and teaching have examined how literacy is evolving in response to rapidly changing digital information and networked technologies. He has recently authored Adobe Creative Cloud Across the Curriculum, a guide for students and teachers, and Becoming a College Writer, a Multimedia Text. And it looks like we're ready to go. I'm going to pass it off to Todd Taylor. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to use the lab mic. I don't know if it's is the lab mic working? The lab mic? Can the Zoom people hear me good? It's, it's, it's in the right place for the lab mic. OK. We'll use this one. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, everyone who went before me set, set this up perfectly for me. Uh, it, Bonnie and I are actually kind of part of the same family tree. The mentor that she described, uh, who, who gave her this sort of digital rhetorics pedagogy of remix, was a former graduate student of mine. I directed his dissertation. And so in the early uh, 2000s, we were working on this pedagogy together while he was in graduate school. So we're, it's nice to be connected. I've been a friend of Amir's for, for a couple of years now, and it's great to finally be here and see the extremely exciting things going on, and uh, special thanks to the, to the, the speakers who went before me, uh, setting this up perfectly for, for us. Um, those people who are on Zoom, I'm going to be playing uh, one video, um, and you're not going to be able to hear the audio on Zoom uh, through the Zoom channel. Uh, so if you want to, in fact, everyone in this, in this audience can go to this URL, toddtaylormyportfolio.com, and, and, and write down and capture that URL, although, although we will sell it, send it to you later, because it has this presentation itself whoop, here. And so, let's see. So this is uh, toddtaylormyportfolio.com, and there's a lot of resources here that, that I will be talking about. But if you want to follow along with my presentation, click on this first picture of, of the campus, and then click on it again. And then we're going to go through here. So start at toddtaylormyportfolio.com, and then click through there. And so as Courtney said, my research and teaching for over 25 years has really been looking at how literacy is evolving in response to information digital and network technologies. And so even though my PhD is in English, it's actually in rhetoric. Uh, I started in graduate school studying ancient Greek rhetoric, but became very interested in what we originally called the rhetoric of new media, uh, but now it, we, we are calling digital media. And so um, my work on my campus is, is really focused on the first year writing program. Uh, like Bonnie, I direct the first year writing program at UNC Chapel Hill. It is, on our campus, the one course that nobody gets out of. It is the de facto introduction to the university. It is uh, 240 sections a year, 105 instructors, 4,385 students will take that class this year. And so no one gets out of it, no dual credit, no AP. 
nothing. It's the one experience that everything on my campus is about. And so I have many titles and directing the writing program is one of them. But I like to think my favorite title and most appropriate title is pedagogical evangelist. Pedagogical evangelist. I'm all about uh, helping transform teaching and learning in the ways we've already been hearing about this morning. And my trick or my sort of angle is to use powerful digital technologies to that end. And so there'll be a very clear theme that you'll probably get tired of me talking about, which is I'm not very interested in students learning technologies. I'm interested in leveraging technologies to transform teaching and learning so that we can improve every aspect of what we do for our, under, for our, our students at this university. And in my experience, whenever there's a new technological moment or new technological opportunity, it, it, it becomes an invitation to innovation. It becomes an excuse to get people like yourselves in a room together to think about where they want to go. What do you want to do differently? How do you want to transform your classes? And then how can we use these new opportunities and these new capabilities as an excuse, or an occasion, an invitation to pursue that innovation? And so to me, uh, there are lots of ways that integrating technology into a curriculum, into a syllabus, into a class can go very wrong. But they never go wrong if you get people like yourself sitting around talking uh, openly and critically and progressively about what might be possible, right? And so um, you will see, not to, not to give away the ending, but the, part of the conclusion of my talk is going to be that all the research uh, we've seen about student success and retention and learning shows that high touch pedagogy is the key. And in order to use these technologies to do that, my experience has been that faculty development and support is the limiting reagent to getting to those pedagogies, but you can get there, and which is why we're gonna actually follow up these, these sessions with actual hands-on workshops where you can prove to yourself as a faculty member how this might work. All the conversations I'm aware of are interested in Bloom's taxonomy, where we're trying to promote uh, these verbs at the top of the pyramid. Um, that maybe uh, content consumption, understanding and remembering content is, is a basis for the more deep and, and, and significantly impactful kinds of learning that happen when you ask students to create, evaluate, analyze, and apply uh, with the knowledge or the content that they've already absorbed. So the idea being, if you're going to try to do something new and different with an instructional technology, um, we want to focus on that, that more creative, productive, active aspect of it. The World Economic Forum rep reports that you need the 10 skills listed below in order to th thrive in 2020. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. And so um, we know that technologies are going to change and economies are going to change and cultures and societies are going to change. And so we don't want to prepare students, at least I don't want to, to do some specific task that we know is going to be outdated or different within five years. We are preparing students for jobs that don't even exist yet. And so to me, that means you have to prepare them to do those higher order things in Bloom's taxonomy that make, makes them versatile, lifelong learners. And so every application of uh, Adobe Creative Cloud and of digital learning uh, I'm gonna, that I'm going to review is going to focus on just that kind of approach. And so uh, we know we're all familiar with the conversation about active learning at this point, how it used to be, certainly when I was an undergraduate, that, was, that the educational experience was mostly focused on content delivery and consumption. And so many people, when they think about instructional technologies, they think about delivering content again. And if you ask me, that's a waste of money to do things the same way we've always done them with a much more expensive tool, right? So there's also a lot of talk about surveillance and assessment and administration, and those things are important. But to me, what makes these pedagogies particularly transformative 
is putting the tools in the hands of the students. And so you'll see that everything I'm about is having students making, creating, producing, solving problems with these technologies, and not the faculty member necessarily even putting her hands on the technology much at all. And so that's, uh, that's a tall order. And what we've done at UNC Chapel Hill is we created a very ambitious partnership with Adobe just like or very similar to the one you have now uh, and they have been an amazing partner in the, in the sense that um, look, look at what, what Adobe's promoting today. They're enabling this kind of conversation where it's not software technicians telling you how you should operate your computer but they've put together an occasion like this to get people to sit around and talk about teaching and learning led by people who are pedagogical evangelists like myself, right? And so they've been an amazing partner and there are, there are many paths to God in the sense of ways to transform teaching and learning. It doesn't have to necessarily be Adobe. You have that opportunity. My campus has that opportunity. And so what my experience has been is that, it, that you, once you have a concrete program, a specific, a, a specific sort of initiative, to focus that innovation, things come together much more rapidly and effectively. And so, what is Creative Cloud? What is, it? what is this software package that you now have access to? Who recognizes this icon? What is it? Photoshop. Photoshop. So how many of you are learning just for the first time that Photoshop is not a verb? <laughs> it's an actual trademark product. Okay, and so we start with that because it's most famous. Uh, and what does this icon stand for? Adobe Illustrator. Adobe Illustrator. Uh, let's see who's really, really savvy. How about this? Rush. Premier Rush. This is game changing, well, which is why we're going to have a workshop later this afternoon. It's a, it's a new video editor that came out in October that is the perfect app for higher education at this moment. But, um, and who, who recognizes this icon? Good. I, this is the most important application in the Creative Cloud suite. Uh, it's not actually an application, and I made up this icon. And it doesn't stand for what you think it stands for. It stands for students, student experience. This is the beginning and the end. The reason to do everything is to transform, improve, and, and focus like a laser on that student experience. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I like, uh, you know, I have in mind, but I never quite do it, of actually putting this icon on the desktop of my computer and on the physical desktop of my office space to always focus on this. Because the classic mistake with instructional technology is to get so wrapped up in all these buttons and wires and, and flashy stuff that you forget what you're trying to do in the first place. And so after 25 years, of, of innovation and consulting with faculty and leading fa faculty workshops in, in instructional technology, it, you have to have this frame as your starting point. What do you want to do differently? How do you want to innovate? What problems are you seeing in the classroom? What things do you might want to address, such as that new 2025 mandate about student retention? And you say, how can we use these technologies, not as an add-on, not as a weight of something else I've got to do, but as a way to reduce the friction or the way to enable getting to those, uh, those learning outcomes and those goals and those mandates that you're trying to achieve in your curriculum. And so that's the way I think all conversations regarding instructional technology sh should begin. And I think that's the way that um, you should work with your colleagues and your programs and your units uh, to, to brainstorm, to innovate, to think about how you might do something differently that makes it easier for you get, to get to the mandates and the outcomes you're trying to achieve. People are, are kind of shocked to find out that there are English professors like Bonnie and myself who are very comfortable with and, and are, are have lots of ideas about using technology in a composition class. But it's actually a nationwide trend that isn't even eccentric anymore. There isn't a writing program director in this country that isn't aware of this significant trend toward what's called by various things, but we'll call it multimodal composition, 
We want students composing in a variety of modalities, in a variety of genres, in a variety of disciplinary situations in order for them to sort of triangulate that experience and transfer those sensibilities to other contexts. And so in 2008, uh, I was sitting in my office as a writing program director knowing that I wanted to have a digital literacy component to our first year writing class. I, I knew that I wanted to do that 10 years ago, but I couldn't do it because I, I didn't have the software. In fact, we were using all kinds of software and because of budget cuts, uh, I don't know but you, if you know, the Uni University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill is the first public university in this nation. And so we are relatively well funded, but at the moment, over the last 10 years, we've had a, a, a legislature that doesn't like us very much. And, and even though the revenue curve has returned in the state of North Carolina, uh, they, have, they continue to cut our funding. And so I had software that I was using very effectively in my classes. It's being taken away from me. Every time I ask for anything, the answer is no. And I'm sitting there in, in my office going, I'm not preparing the students in our writing classes uh, for everything that we are explicitly promising in terms of education in the new century because I don't have the software. And then I got an email from our, my CIO, his name is Chris Kielt, and he says, <laughs> it was really kind of mean, he was like, Todd, uh, I'd like to talk to you, can you come to my office? I'm like, ooh, I'm getting, what did I do? <laughs> what did I download? Uh, why is, why, is the, why is the principal asking me to come to the office? Um, 15 years ago, I, 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 had, I knew who the CIA was, and, and I had resources. In fact, my nickname in ITS was Spike, because anytime I tried something new, I would spike the servers and things would crash. And, um, so, but I, you know, I haven't heard from the CIO in, in 15 years, right? So he, he, he contacts me and he says, we're going to Clemson University, and they have this partnership with Adobe where they provide Adobe Creative Cloud for all of their students. Uh, would you like to go? And I go there, and like Bonnie and like my graduate student, we all know each other. We're all writing program people. We have been on this idea for a long time. Uh, we see the presentation. We, I sit down. Fortunately, I sat down next to my CIO, and he looks over at me. He goes, well, do you have any ideas of what you might do with this? I'm saying, are you kidding me? I've got 20 years of ideas. I just need someone to pull the trigger. Because what I was doing at the time was I was telling students not to download the 30-day free trial of Adobe Creative Cloud until April 1st so they could finish their projects by May 1st. That's where we were. <laughs> and, I, and then all of a sudden, the CIO is sitting next to me going, do you have any ideas? I'm like, I've, I do. And so I was just extremely fortunate that our CIO is like your CIO quite visionary, quite visionary. He can see lunch coming from a mile across the room. <laughs> and he made a difference. He made the difference. OK. And so hopefully, those of you on Zoom um, uh, can, can have, have found this, because I'm going to play a, a piece of video now. Um, and you're not going to be able to hear it. So if you get ready to click out, here it goes. North Carolina, Chapel Hill is the first public university in the United States, and so of course we take that with a great sense of pride. There's a sense in which students who arrive here appreciate that they have a special opportunity. The partnership between UNC and Adobe Creative Cloud has provided licenses for every single student. It's only natural that you would want to take the most powerful collection of digital literacy tools and, and make them accessible to your students because this is how knowledge is made. The students find it extremely engaging to use Adobe Creative Cloud to get their work done in any class anywhere across the curriculum. So nursing, business, public health, even physics, chemistry, religious studies, and anthropology are using these tools not to learn how they work, but to help support teaching and learning. Everyone having access to this also means that you can learn from one another, which I think is going to be the best training tool and adoption tool as this continues to grow in the next couple of years. The engagement when students are working on digital projects goes way up. And I think that's linked to internal motivation as opposed to being motivated for a grade. What was really great about watching my students do this video poetry assignment 
was the students started to better understand their poems. It can happen in traditional ways, but the technology kind of makes really unexpected things jump out. I define digital literacy as critical digital literacy, which means it's not just the ability to use digital and information tools, it's the ability to think critically and to get critical work done with them. If I can use digital tools to move students to be active producers of knowledge rather than passive consumers, then I think it's really valuable. Students. Are that tagline that came, by the way, is the lavalier working? So I can put this down. Yes? Okay. So I can use both hands, my Italian side. Um, that tagline that my colleague Danny Anderson just said is the theme to everything I've been doing professionally for 25 years. We want to take generations of information media consumers and we want to turn them into or help them become information media and content producers. We want them to be able to make that deep connection between what they're doing in each of our classrooms all across the curriculum in every discipline, make the connection between what they're doing in the class with the world they live in. We want, that is the deepest form of knowledge is when you can take content and actually have the ideas make an impact in circulation in the world, right? That's when all the things that all the speakers were talking about this morning come together. And so if there's one concept to, to, to take from this, it's how do, how do we approach these technologies? It's to try to make students active producers of knowledge instead of passive consumers. And so what that looks like is Students would prototype a mobile app using an, a, an application called XD instead of writing a proposal. And so in a first year writing class, one of the most popular units right now in, in my home campus is to do a collaborative shark tank exercise uh -huh. where each group uh, puts together and proposes an, a mobile app. And they do market research, they research the app, and then they prototype the actual design using this, this very intuitive and easy to use application called XD. And then they present their application and there's a competition uh, who has the most shark tankable um, product. And so instead of writing a proposal uh, in a first year writing class, they're actually prototyping something that is connected with the pr proposal. Instead of students doing your typical uh, literature review, students are collaborating to publish a scientific journal using InDesign, which is desktop publishing software, instead of just writing a literature review alone. And so instead of Scientific Tar Heel, I mean, instead, of, instead of Scientific American, it's Scientific Tar Heel. And oh. <laughs> each student researches an issue that's important to them, and then this journal becomes a collection of that. And what makes this so powerful is they knew from the very first minute that this was meant to circulate. The audience for this was not intended to be just a, a teacher, just an instructor. It was meant for people in the world to learn something about a scientific issue or a medical or health science issue that was important to them. And so this, this looks like students using Spark to design presentation microsites instead of formatting your conventional slide deck. And so uh, this presentation you're looking at right now is a Spark page. All of my lesson plans, everything I do is now done in Spark page because it's so easy for to me to link and share it. And and I you know I, I put this link together a week ago, and then I could sit there in the back row and revise it throughout the previous presentations, and it all happens online. So students raise awareness by creating a documentary film using Premiere Rush instead of writing a research paper. And so those are just some typical examples and. You know, think about the verbs in Bloom's taxonomy, right? Now students are, the kinds of things they're doing are prototyping, collaborating, publishing, designing, raising awareness, composing and creating. They're not consuming. They're not passive consumers of ideas, right? And so I want my students to participate in that world. Uh, I want them to be a part of this really special moment. And so this really is an invitation to make a difference. This is a really particular moment that's exciting for the reasons, maybe some of the reasons why the, the previous renaissance from many centuries ago was exciting. It's because there was suddenly this uh, reunification uh, of things where 
uh, technology and humanity are suddenly coming together, and art and science are suddenly working together in, in, in this brand new marriage that has the potential to transform anything. And so uh, I like this image because it's both mathematical in its attempt to capture the human form geometrically, but it's also organic in that it's very much still for, um, part using the, the human form. And so what we have everywhere, and I, I'm, I'm pretty familiar, fairly familiar, because I've, I've, I've spoken a lot with, with uh, Amir about what's happening in the CSU system right now, about how all the new mandates and guidelines for the next 10, 15 years, right? There isn't a campus that I know of that isn't going through these same things. And it, it, it is this moment of re-examination and re-evaluation and re-articulation of who we are and what we do in higher education. And, and I think the, the best way to address that is to, to think about focusing on the student experience and using this particular moment of digital transformation every, everywhere in every profession and in every industry in the industrialized world as an opportunity to, to get to where we want to go in the ways that we want to get there. And I find this to be very potentially top down, but I have learned that the people who have ideas about what to do with these technologies are the ones who eventually can make a difference. That, you know, I've worked very hard for 25 years on the quality of our interdisciplinary writing across the curriculum program. And the deans respect what we do and they appreciate it. But they're not interested in that. They're never going to have a conversation with me about our writing pedagogy. But when I bring to them a digital literacy initiative, all of a sudden they are very interested in what I have to say. And they, and they see the writing program is, is definitely connected with it and, and part of the new direction of the university. And so um, my experience is that you want to have an understanding and a facility with these things because it is highly influential. And so um, what we've done at UNC Chapel Hill is we've approached uh, our partnership with Adobe Creative Cloud as kind of a virtual or digital makerspace. Uh, is, raise your hand if you're aware that, of makerspaces on this campus. Do you, do, do you know what makerspace is? OK. And so anyone here involved with that makerspace? OK. So, yeah. So could you briefly define the initiative and what's available here? Well, currently we have the space that IT runs, which is the innovation makerspace. And I'm one of the librarians here at Cal State Fullerton. Um, but the library and IT are also having a conversation about expanding that concept of the makerspace. Because it's a concept that's been in public libraries and K-12 libraries for about 15 years. Um, the concept of making and doing. And so we're looking in the library at expanding and adding makerspace that's beyond just digital, too, because there's other types of making. And so what are the necessary. key sort of stations or components that are currently? Well, currently what we have are things like touch screen and visualization ability. We have the, the 3D printers in there, but um, the printing goes through IT, not the students yet. So we're having discussions about making 3D printers available to the students. And we have a virtual reality machine, a couple other products like that. Great. So, uh, so a makerspace is based upon that pedagogy, this, this entrepreneurial concept of students problem solving, engineering, making, designing with their hands. Uh, and a lot of these makerspaces, and this is ours, there are sewing machines. And there are laser cutters and, and carpeting tools and welding tools, right? So the idea is students go collaborate and connect in these spaces, making things and solving problems. And so what we did was we, th we approached uh, our partnership with Adobe Creative Cloud as a digital or virtual makerspace that scales because this is where our students are. And you can do all of this. You can use the Creative Cloud here as much as a designated lab or station. And so those makerspaces are wonderful, but they don't scale. And, uh, and I, I don't know about your campus, but I assume you probably have a lot of uh, students here who are, may, might be part-time, who are working people who, who can't physically get access to that very special and ideal space. But they can access a virtual makerspace, such as Creative Cloud, 
where you can make videos, you can make podcasts, you can make magazines, you can make websites, you can even make and prototype mobile applications anywhere that this goes. So their work is anywhere that, uh, they can work anywhere where they have a problem they need to solve or a challenge they need to face. And so um, we put together a flipped model at UNC Chapel Hill where most places, just a couple of years ago, would provide Adobe Creative Cloud for faculty and staff, instructional designers, uh, staff people, but the students had to go to that, that special lab to get it. And so we flipped the model, and we said, well, we're gonna take our money, and we're gonna put these technologies in the hands of students. And then faculty have to apply to get their, lesson, to get their at license. And they had to apply based upon a pedagogical justification. They had to write a short paragraph about how they were gonna use Creative Cloud to transform teaching and learning in their class. And these are all the departments with faculty who wrote those applications in the first semester. And so what's so amazing to me about this is I'm having conversations with people in nursing and public health that I never imagined as a humanities professor I would because when we started talking about this initiative, the people in nursing were like, I couldn't believe they were in the room. And they're like, are you kidding me? Everything we need to do now has, has to be through digital transformation. So much of our practical work and practical work is done through AR, VR, visualization, and, 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 and these exact modes. And so what we're finding is there isn't any place in the curriculum where, where digital transformation just like this isn't happening. And the, the list of professors who applied for these things demonstrates that significantly. And so um, what I'm finding is that digital literacy might have been, of this uh, concept, might have been kind of an eccentric idea five years ago. And it was eccentric because the applications were kind of inaccessible. But the new generation of applications, the new generation of library and support staff, the new generation of faculty like myself and Bonnie uh, have enough experience now that this is easy to do. In fact, that's why we're having a hands-on workshop. So those of you who are feeling like, man, this is something else uh, that's gonna take away from my already you know, too long a list of things I need to do, you can do this. Uh, the, fr the friction is going down. Uh, it's becoming much easier. And so it's become to the point where digital literacy is a no-brainer. There isn't a strategic plan, a mission statement, a vision statement for any program, curricula, college, or school that doesn't say we need to prepare students for this world, right? The question is how are you gonna do it? And what does it look like when that's done? And so I'm gonna play a video, and so those of you in the Zoom space, if you click on this link right here to 741, up will pop this video. I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna hit play. Uh, this, I'm gonna set up this video. This video is called Our Lives Together. And it was created by a student who never edited a video in her life. This is the first video she's ever made. It tells the story of an elderly couple where the father is suffering from advanced Alzheimer's. And I want you to watch very, very closely at how sophisticated and professional this editing is by a student who never touched video before in her life. It's an illustration of the kinds of literacies and abilities that are now possible. And so this, again, is Our Lives Together by Carrie Lewis. I think she is an incredibly giving person and I think she um, tries to do her best to um, be a great wife, be a great caregiver to my dad. I think she takes her marriage covenant with my dad very seriously and tries to honor that and is just uh, an incredibly giving person and um, has always put everybody else ahead of herself her whole life. And so she continues to live that out um, right now. I think it's been difficult um, not only having to make decisions that she's not used to making, but also just to go through the pain of him not recognizing people and just deteriorating physically and the frustration of you know, say asking the same questions over and over every five minutes 
uh, because he doesn't remember that he asked them already. Those kinds of things, you know, are hard and they're frustrating, but um, she does, she's incredibly patient and incredibly kind, incredibly loving, and um, just continues to work through it. As long as there's breath, there is a plan. And I think there's great, there's untold joy in fitting into that plan. When all is said and done, that's really the point. What pleases the Lord? I mean, what what fulfills what He created us to be and to do? You know, even even if it were that you never touched the real person, which I don't believe that, but if it were, I think I would still feel the same way because this is this is the man that, you know, I have lived with and honored and cared for. This this is the commitment. This is marriage. This is our lives together. And so compare the student experience of that with your typical research paper on Alzheimer's. Now, research papers are still important. In fact, there's a lot of conventional, traditional writing that prepare her to make this film. I'm an academic, like most of you, and I can't remember a single research paper that I wrote as an undergraduate. When Beverly asked that question earlier, I was like, this is a perfect setup for me. This student's never going to forget this assignment, and neither am I as her, as her teacher. And so this is the goal. This is where we're trying to get. And um, to have the students prove to themselves that the work that they're doing matters, that it's meant to circulate. There's another really fascinating dimension of this particular assignment and project is, in what class does this belong? You know, well, okay, you know, communications, journalism, but then you think about it, sociology, psychology, gerontology, public health, and if you think more broadly about the genre of audiovisual documentary this is appropriate in every single discipline, right? And the tools now that our students have in their pocket, you know, high quality video with an international distribution network at the touch of a button, and the applications now to do this effectively mean that we are in a really special moment where we have a lot of opportunity to make a big transformation. And so on our campus, we knew this is where we wanted to go. We just needed the opportunity to get there. And so I'm going to tell a, a quick anecdote about, you know, we, we, we started the, uh, the, the partnership with Adobe in September of 2016. And in November of, of, that, of that year, the chancellor, the provost, and the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences came to the Department of English for the first time in 20 years and asked us to each have report on the innovative things we're doing. And we had 90 seconds. And so halfway through my 90 seconds, I was talking about this initiative that we just started. And our original plan was to pilot two dozen sections of first year writing in the second year, and then double that. And then in the third year, scale it out to all 240 sections of writing. And the chancellor interrupted me in the middle of that, that presentation. And she, she said, did you say three years? You're going to take three years to do full implementation? <laughs> And I said, yeah, we, we don't want to rush things. We want to scale up carefully. She goes, no, I don't want that. I want full implementation immediately. And so I don't sleep that night because <laughs> I've got 105 instructors that have to get prepared to do this by the, the coming August. And so since that moment, uh, I've been in full scramble mode to put together the resources and the experiences and the workshops like the ones we're going to lead after lunch that flatten the learning curve so, so that technology gets out of the way and actually helps, reduce, helps remove friction towards what it is you're trying to accomplish in your class. Promoting teaching and learning, making it more engaging, making it more active, making it do what all the research on student success and retention and all those numbers show that when students are, are, are invited, are genuinely invited, to produce and share intellectual work in engaging, active ways. Then they connect to a campus. 
then they feel like they belong, then they understand why they're doing what they're doing, and they feel like they can succeed. And so uh, since then, uh, I, with, the, with the generous support of Adobe, who's just been the most incredible partner in all this, uh, we put together uh, a lots of resources. The first is this e-textbook uh, called uh, Adobe Creative Cloud Across the Curriculum, a guide for students and teachers. It's online, for free, available to the entire world. And even though I made it for my instructors, it's, it's appropriate for any class anywhere across the curriculum. And so notice how it begins with, you know, what do you want to create today? Chapter one is about solving problems. It's not about learning software. And then as you go into each chapter, let's say you've decided that you want to make a magazine. It talks about why make a print document? What are the advantages of that choice? And then each of these chapters ends with teaching modules that are turnkey. So this one is the one about the, the, the popular science magazine that I showed you earlier. And this was done by you know, an instructor who was, had only been teaching writing for about two years. It's just, I would have never thought of using desktop publishing software this way. Uh, it was just so clever and ingenious. And what we've done is we've captured the very best uh, assignments and we put them together exactly in the way that Beverly talked about earlier, which is um, we have uh, the assignment prompt and rubric in PDF form. We have lesson plans in MS Word format so that you can download them and revise them and make them your own. There's a link to the student work completed. There's the tutorial that's appropriate for beginners and not necessarily advanced people. And then there's the instructor overview. Uh, oops, that's not going to work. That's OK. Um, instructor overview where the instructor herself narrates what she's doing and so what we're finding is that's the that's the most important part of all this is this you know the the, the instructor just describes in a, in a in a narrated video what she did with this assignment how it worked uh, mistakes she made and how she can make, do it better next time and so um, this is what I've been up to for 25 years. Here are all the all of the Spark presentations I've given over the last 18 months. Uh, they're all here. This is again ToddTaylor.myportfolio.com. This is actually an Adobe portfolio. This is part of Creative Cloud that enables me to capture everything this way. And so uh, there's a link to the textbook. Um, and then under teaching, there is also a link to this PDF which has a, a, it's an index to all of these different resources that we've, that we've created. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, thoughts or questions, um, maybe from the chat group or it, from the audience right now. We are going to, Courtney, um, we're going to have a workshop on Spark after lunch, hands on. And, and this workshop is perfect if you're sitting there thinking, I, I'll never figure this out because it'll blow your mind what you said earlier, how easy this is. That there is no learning curve with Spark. In fact, if you can't make it, you can go to your class tomorrow and say, hey, that, that, that research paper or whatever that conventional word processing assignment that's on your syllabus, you have the option of going to spark.adobe.com, getting, getting your account, and creating it there and just see what happens. Just see what happens. And to compare the two, the students who took that options with the ones who didn't. And if you, if you put one of those drafts up in class, in progress, the entire class is going to pick Spark instead of the word processor. Oh, amazing. <laughs> right? And you don't have to spend one minute of class time explaining to students how to operate it. Just tell them to go do it, and they will figure it out. Now, most applications are not that intuitive. But that one is special. So we're going to do a workshop on that. And then we're going to do a workshop on exactly the kind of video that I just demonstrated before that's, that's in, interview-based, evidence-based, expert-based, that's appropriate to any class and any discipline. So any quick thoughts or questions? I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm sure no one has any questions. I don't have a question, but it's more like actually input actually for the Adobe actually what you can do because actually I checked actually your website and then it seems like actually I could not use my text to speech yeah applications because I mean from special education department and I see this actually potentials really a lot for students who have disabilities and I 
think actually if we can add actually some features that's going to make accessible these tools, that's going to be, I think, really empowering for everyone, not just for students, for not just for us, yeah, for everyone. I think that's going to how you have to move forward. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, just an input. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so uh, it, it's an explicit part of Adobe's mission to make these accessible, make all these tools as widely accessible as possible, as many people as possible. It's all happening so fast. There's a million K through 12 students in India using Spark right now for free, right? And so uh, physical uh, and ideological socioeconomic access is really important, and Adobe's actively working on that. Um, that's, that's the next piece that I specifically want to focus on, is putting together a whole bunch of standards and, and, and ideas for accessibility. Um, working with these tools in your class naturally brings up the, com the conversation about accessibility, about privacy, and about copyright. And that's, that's great because you need, students need to be a part of that conversation. Students need to be aware about the discussion of accessibility themselves as they take what they're doing here and go into professional, and, and, and go into professions and careers where, they, where they are, they're gonna be responsible for exactly these kinds of considerations. So by assigning this work now, you start that conversation now with your students so that people are aware of these issues that everyone needs to know about. Along those, along those lines, I do just want to stress really partnering with your librarians because when it comes to the ethical use of information and technology, privacy, intellectual property, fair use, copyright, as well as access, uh, and the accessibility, it's, it's an access issue. We hear about it as a mandate in the CSU system that we have to do it this way, but we don't often translate that into why, why it's so critical. It's an issue of access, and we're limiting access to particular demographics if it's not uh, accessible. Our students can't learn, they can't teach. But even with the intellectual property issues, that's just the kind of areas that your librarians uh, live and work in, so partner with us. We're happy to help. Yeah, it's, it's, it, and you know, these are the teachable moments. These are the conversations we, we absolutely must have in our class. And this creates the occasion to do that. If, if there is some friction, and there is, these things are happening so quickly. I mean, you know, Adobe's scrambling just to get Premiere Rush working on Android right now. Um, and, and, and these things are happening so fast that there, there's going to be some friction. But I, I promise you that Adobe has lots of people working on accessibility and a, a number of statements and updates on these issues. Uh, Spark, in fact, since it came out, has actually improved a lot. It's got one more major step to go, which is alt image tags. Uh, so, um, but there are ways in, to temporarily provide that kind of thing through captions and that kind of stuff. So, anyway, th other thoughts or questions before you get to eat lunch? Anyway, so again, Courtney and I will be here after lunch. Um, thank you so much. It was so wonderful to finally come out to this campus and meet everybody. Uh, so, and I just thanks to the speakers who came before me. Thank you, Todd. So before we all part ways, I just want to say thank you to all of our virtual friends. Um, you guys were super engaging today. We thank you for our questions. I have been reassured by the Fullerton AV team here that they have been recording the live feed on their system, and we'll be sharing that out along um, with decks and resources and all sorts of follow-up information for all of you that attended today. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna break for lunch. Um, we'll meet back here at 1.15. And for those of you online, the, the rest of the day, as Todd indicated, is very hands-on, so we don't really have anything to stream for you. Um, but you just have to come to the next one that we're gonna do for the CSUs. Um, and before we part, I just really wanna give a shout out to the Fullerton AV team. For those of you that don't know, we were actually here like way early this morning and troubleshooting, and we have certainly been keeping them on their toes today. So, Zapita, Matthew, if you guys wanna stand, Lucy, Dusty, just please recognize these folks. They've been working their tails off today. Um, and hallelujah, we had, a, we had audio and video for the last half. So thank you all for your patience. Enjoy your lunch. 
And for those of you online, you'll be hearing from me soon. And please don't hesitate to reach out to Liz or myself or any of us today that shared our information with any further questions. Thanks. So if it's okay with you, I think I'll just kind of walk the room in TA. Sure. I just had way too much going on yesterday. Thank you. 